Big day today. Oh, yeah. Big, big day. For years, Soprano fans have been asking for new Soprano content. The wait is over. We are very excited that The Many Saints of Newark, a Soprano story, is now available to see in theaters. Also on HBO Max. Now, if you're a fan of The Sopranos or just a fan of good filmmaking, you got to see this movie. We think this is such a big deal that today we're dedicating this entire show to the many saints of Newark. Coming up, we're going to be joined by the star of the film, Alessandro Nivola, who plays Dicky Moltisante. Uh, in many ways, this film is the Dicky Moltisante story. And Alessandro, in my opinion, is going to be nominated for an Academy Award. He is absolutely spectacular. Yes, it's a great, great movie. You've got to go see this movie. Michael Gandolfini will join us, who is brilliant as a young Tony Soprano. Corey Stahl, who plays Uncle Junior, will be with us. John McGarrow who does a great job. He knocks it out of the park as a young Silvio Dante. And Leslie Odom Jr., whose character never appeared in the Soprano series, but adds so much depth to this film. And is one of the reasons it's so fantastic. Leslie Odom Jr. is just great in this. Then we'll be joined by the big man himself. We'll finish up with a special interview with the creator of The Sopranos in this film, Mr. David Chase. It's going to be a great show. We're really excited. First, check out the trailer to the movie, and then let's get into our interview with the great Alessandro Navola. When I was a kid, guys like me were brought up to follow codes. Hey, jerk off. What'd you say? What? Antonio Soprano. I wonder if I can talk to you alone for a moment, Mrs. Soprano. On the basis of the Sanford Binet, he's high IQ. You can't prove it by me. He's got a D-plus average. Well, he doesn't apply himself, but he is smart. The results tell us. He's a leader. Ankle dick. Growing up with the family... ...takes a toll. Maybe an ambassador to England or France. You're my nephew. My life to gamble. I want to do whatever I can to help you. you may be a my gift to you. I, I want to go to college. I can't get called with shit like this. Look, you take the speakers, right? At the same time, you say to yourself, this is the last time I'm ever going to steal something. It's that simple. Let me go talk to him. He only listens to Dickie. Gotta do something about Dickie Malasani. Maybe some of the things you do aren't God's favor. You lead by example. We'll make the right decision. This kid's got what it takes. As your nephew goes, I'm listening. Stay out of his life. Look at the snow. Got yourself here. Nowhere else but Talking Sopranos do you get the cast of this movie. Nowhere else. Right I don't think so. Here. I don't know. In, I, I, in this I, I, shitty, dirty fucking podcast that we do, we have great guests. <laughs> is podcast it world, I think, is kind of the bottom of the barrel of show business now. It, it yeah. has become that, I think. And we're the bottom of the barrel of the bottom of the barrel. But our guest is not. Actually, <laughs> this is this, you know, he is the star of The Many Saints of Newark, without a doubt. He's an award-winning uh, actor of stage and screen. Graduated from Yale University, so he's no fucking dummy. Was nominated for a Tony Award for The Elephant Man, opposite uh, Bradley Cooper on Broadway. He's appeared in over 50 films and TV series, including 
American Hustle, Face Off, Jurassic Park 2, Selma and the Wizard of Lies. And he just steals this movie. He is so good in it. He plays Dickie Moltisanti in The Many Saints of Newark. Please welcome Alessandro Nivola, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, there he is. Hey. <laughs> I'm so happy to join the dirty, shitty, podcast. dirty, <laughs> shitty bottom of the barrel podcast. Thanks for joining. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't really believe that. We we try to be a little bit humble. Um, but, uh, what do you mean? Podcasts are like the most highbrow thing now. I you guess like, so, but you know, in reality, the elite. Yeah, if you watch how the sausage is made, you'll realize very quickly it's <laughs> the bottom of the barrel. But it is. It's but very you know elite. What? The thing about this, Alessandro, we didn't we didn't know what we were doing when we started. We don't know what we're doing now, but we have a ton of people listen and we're very successful. Let me ask you. Yeah, how did you meet David Chase? How'd you get involved with the many saints? Uh I you know, it was totally the old fashioned way. Like I, I got the somebody, well, they sent me a, a, a piece of the script because David's very protective of his, of sure. his material as, as you guys no doubt know. Um, so I didn't read the whole thing. I read, I think, I think they sent me like 30 pages of the script or something. And, and then they sent me a bunch of pages to prepare an audition for. And, um, uh, you know, I had a I, I had a feeling that it was a pretty good part from the <laughs> from the bit that I read, but I, I hadn't read the whole thing. And so I didn't know I didn't know where it was going and I didn't know, you know, I, I was trying to kind of piece together the story a little bit. But the scenes were obviously well written and uh, I knew it was a big opportunity. So I did I, I prepared uh, an audition uh, from the from the pages that was sent to me and. And, um, you know, I prepared really hard <laughs> and uh, I, th I took a couple of weeks and worked on it and then taped it and sent it in. Uh, and then I heard that that they they really liked it and, and that they wanted to meet me. So that was, um, you know, all that took place over the course of uh, a month or so. And then. And then we had this we had this lunch, me and, and David and Alan Taylor, the director. And um, we just met up in, in a restaurant in Tribeca and and shot the shit for a, a couple of hours. And then and then I left. And then on my way, I was on, I was on my way to the airport to go to Australia where my wife was working. And I I um got a text while I was in the car having left that lunch saying they were going to send me the rest of the script. So I thought that was a good sign. And then I read the script and, and uh, you know, I didn't realize it was the lead role of the movie. I, you know, and, and they didn't tell you that. No, I mean, I don't think so. I think it was just like, they're making a prequel to the Sopranos it's a really good part, something like that. I no. think that's all I knew. And no, and I didn't know the whole story. I didn't know, I, I didn't know shit, you know? I just like, I, I just knew it was that the dialogue was good. And, um, and then I read it on the plane going to Australia and I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> like, this is like a whole, this is a whole thing, like, well, you know. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, <laughs> did you have to audition again or it was just that one time on tape? I didn't. I mean, I did a lot of scenes. I, I taped like five scenes. I mean, my, I, I did like my whole performance, all like the biggest scenes in the movie I taped. I had like everybody was named different things. And some of the scenes changed from the very time. Secretive, that I, very secretive. Yeah. Uh, did you uh, ever audition for The Sopranos? No, no. I mean, I think when that was, what, what was the first year? 98? 98, 98 was the season 99. one. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I, no. I mean, to, you know, to be honest, like, I, I've, I've hardly ever been cast in, like, Italian-American parts. Uh, it wasn't until, I think American Hustle was, like, the first time that I was ever cast that way. And then 
I really like I've had so few opportunities to, you know, play roles that that uh, where I got to draw on my own personal history and my own family and all that. Like I uh, people didn't see me that way. I'd gone to Yale and I, I don't know. I, I was playing English uh, parts at the beginning of my career a lot more than so much that people thought I, people were asking if I could do an American accent. <laughs> like, really? I couldn't. And, where'd uh, you grow up? Uh, you know, I moved around so much. So, uh, it was kind of, you know, I didn't really have like roots anywhere. I kind of, um, drifted or, you know, I was uh, every, I, I went to like seven different schools from, from, kindergarten to college or something like I, I changed schools a lot I only have one friend I got one friend from from uh I'm <laughs> really sorry for me now are you uh are you Italian American on both sides of your family no no just my dad's side what did you base Dickie on? Like, how did you, what was your way into that character? Was there somebody in, that you had in mind that you, you know, used for, for him or was it? Um, you know, it was like a patchwork of stuff. I, um, I did a lot of, uh, well, I, 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 you know, I started out in, in Newark. I had a friend who's a priest there who, um, Italian American guy who grew up there and he was kind of like one of the last, I mean, all the Italians moved out of that area up, up North into, uh, you know, Nutley and, and Bloomfield and, you know, the pasta triangle. And, uh, and he uh, had actually grown up in the neighborhood where I would have lived, um, you know, before the kind of exodus and, um, you know, because so much of the movie is really about the forces that drove those guys into suburbia. Yeah. And uh, and so this guy was like, uh, you know, my age, but had had really like, you know, lived there as a kid. And he my uh, the very first day of like research for the part was started at St. Lucy's Church in, in Newark. And I don't know if you've ever been there, but there are two like notable things about St. Lucy's. And one is that there's this uh, stained glass window that's the most beautiful stained glass window. Uh, and it, but if you get if you come up really close and you can see the little caption, it's like written in their gift of Mr. and Mrs. Ruggiero Boyardo. And um, Ruggiero Boyardo was richie the boot and uh richie the boot is the guy that um coppola based or or uh you know the um you know what's his name who wrote the godfather um so, uh, yeah. yeah uh that he he uh based um the the godfather character on and he was like this this mob boss in newark who initially lived in newark and then bought this beautiful big estate out in the country uh, outside uh, Newark where they had like citrus groves and, and uh, you know, classical, you know, statues and shit. And, and there was like a, um, a pizza oven that he had up in the garden. That's where they used to like incinerate the bodies up there and stuff. No way. And um, this guy uh, had gifted this, like beautiful stained glass window to St. Lucy's and it's still in there. Oh, wow. And, uh, and then down in the basement of St. Lucy's is the most amazing, uh, museum, uh, which is like, uh, the Italian American immigrant museum. And there's like, you know, pictures of Joe Pesci when like, he was like a young guy there, you know, just like, you know, hanging out with a bunch of guys at some like March or whatever. And all that, uh, you know, Columbus Day parades, everything, just hundreds and hundreds of photos. So I spent a lot of time down in that basement of St. Lucie's, just like looking at, at pictures of people and trying to like get an image in, in my head. And then I read a lot of books. There's, 
you know, everything I read was about fathers and sons because the whole movie's about fathers and sons and about uh, the ways that, um, you know, the sort of cycles of abuse really that get passed on and the mirror of like, uh, you know, my dad's relationship with me and then my relationship with Tony and then Tony's relationship with, with you, with uh, Chrissy. I mean, you, you know, Dickie Moltisanti was talked about in The <clears throat> Sopranos, but we never saw him. Yeah. Did you, why, first of all, did you watch The Sopranos? Of course. <laughs> and did you go back to watch it before you did this role or no? You didn't bother. Oh, no, I watched it for the role. I, you know, I hadn't watched it when I was younger. I didn't have, I didn't even have HBO when I, in the 90s. Like, I... I uh, I came late to TV and uh, so I hadn't watched it. And then uh, I started watching it when I was just preparing my audition. And I watched like a whole first season just before I even taped my first scenes. And then I watched the whole thing. Uh, you know, once I got the job, I watched the whole thing. In fact, discovered that. One of the, you know, that, that whole episode that takes place in Naples where, uh, you know, they go to, you know, um, Commendatore or whatever. They, uh, they shot a, Tim Van Patten, who lives, by the way, right through the wall on the other side of my, this wall I'm pointing at right here is Tim's, <laughs> Timmy's house. And uh, he shot that episode and it turned out to have one of my granddad's sculptures in the background of a shot. Wow. With, uh, and I even, I think I have a picture of it. That was faith you get in this role. Oh, well, wait. I, told, I told David this and he couldn't, he definitely. In which scene? There was something supernatural going on. Um, you know, here, I'm going to show you a picture of it and see if you can remember exactly where this was. It was, um, it was like down in some like, catacombs kind of place and here look this is the this is the scene can you here can you see that that's that the, two, the, the that's the cave of the sibyl yeah, yeah that's right that's it and no. that is my grandfather's sculpture in the back that's and amazing. then it's even like a, a clip there was a, a solo shot of it that's that's one of his sculptures you were destined to get this man you were destined. Uh, yeah, David, David thought that that was very weird. <laughs> so let me ask you something. So, David, look, we know David a long time. He could be poker face. He doesn't give you much sometimes. Uh, how was he? Did he loosen up a little on the set with you? No, I, I listen. Tim, told, when I was going to meet him at lunch, uh, Tim told me like, don't, don't like expect him to laugh at any of your jokes. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> don't get like freaked out when he has like no reaction to anything you say. And uh, it wasn't like that at all. He was really, he was really like engaged. He was very, really interested in like wanting to know about my family and stuff and my Italian background. And, um, and then basically all, our whole rapport was just jokes, you know? Uh, he had a great sense of humor and loves to laugh. And I think like the stuff that we bonded about most in the in the movie was just the the humor, you know. And did you know Ray Liotta before he played your dad? Did you ever work with him before? No, oh, no, I never worked with him before. Yeah. How was that? Well, he was the guy I was most intimidated by because, like, he was from New Jersey and he was like, you know, mob royalty and and. Uh, you know, everybody else were like actors like me. Uh, and, and he was like, had a sort of connection to the, the real world of the movie that, that none of us, none of the rest of us really did. And, um, and then I just like, and, and then also he's a very like intense and committed guy, like uh, as an actor, um, he really cares about it and he's really uh you can like the way that he looks at at everybody and watches the scenes play out and everything like you you just feel like you can't 
kind of pull pull one over on him and 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 he's also really like um very unpredictable and i mean he's very in the moment it's it's like verging on improvisational i mean obviously with david's stuff you don't you don't make it up but um but you you know i never knew what was going to happen in scenes with him and and that's exciting and that's what you want uh he <laughs> he um at one one day we you know when we were shooting that scene in the car where we get in a fight i mean i can't like you know i yeah. shouldn't give away too much about it but um it was late at night and we were we'd shot this thing a hundred times and it was very like it was very physical uh we we hadn't really rehearsed a kind of specific um uh choreography to it um it was supposed to be just kind of a messy kind of fight that that wasn't supposed to look like you know cool where one guy you know hits a guy and then another guy hits him and he goes like this and it was supposed to be kind of like face you know like all that and and he's a like a big imposing guy and everything we've been doing this thing for a while he had me in the headlock and then and then uh at one point, like I tagged him a little bit and it was just like, it was not hard or anything, but I just felt like, Oh God, you know, I've, I've like, you know, supposed to be, you know, this is supposed to be under control and everything. And I, I went home feeling really guilty about it. And, and then the next day I got a call like early in the morning, I think it was like eight or nine from him. And he was on the phone and he sounded like he had his mouth full of cotton or something. And, and he's like, uh, he's like, uh, Hey, uh, um, Alexandra, how are you doing? Ray? And I'm like, Hey man, what's going on? You know, he's like, uh, no, I just, uh, I, I'm in a hospital on the Upper East Side someplace. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you broke my jaw. And I'm like, I broke your fucking jaw? Are you kidding me? Like, what are you talking about? Like, I, I, I you know, I barely touched you. Come on, I didn't break your jaw. You know, this is no big deal. I, you know, I, I, it's not your fault. I don't want you to feel guilty about it or anything. And, you know, and I was like, well, wh what do you mean? Like, I, I, is it like badly broken? Like, you got like... Uh, is it like a little fracture or like, you know, what's going on? Like, are you, are you in pain? He's like, no, you give me like a whole bunch of pills. I'm feeling great. But, uh, you know, they just put some wires on it and stuff and I'm only going to be out like two weeks. And I'm like, two fucking weeks. I'm just thinking like the producers are going to shit themselves. I'm going to be fired. Like, you know, the whole production's going to shut down, you know? And this goes on and on for like 10 minutes. At this point, I'm like, my heart's just like pounding. I've got like, you know, a panic attack on set. And suddenly I hear, <laughs> I got you. <laughs> you know, and he's like, good impression. <laughs> he's doing like the, he's doing the good fellas laugh. That's funny. And, uh, you know, that's great. It's like, it was his way of like, telling me that it was all right you know what i mean and not to like beat myself up or whatever that's funny <laughs> oh that's um, really and then um he sent me a text at one point and this was early on in the shoot i think and he sent me a text uh at some point saying that i i can't remember how he put it but it was he said something about how i reminded him of himself as Henry Hill and uh like that was kind of the moment that I felt like you know I'm I'm doing I'm doing it right like I'm I'm on to something oh that's cool yeah but it was it was you know you you were you know Dickie is a obviously a a killer a brutal guy but yeah you like him and you're rooting for him I mean I like Dickie Moltisanti yeah he's very well you play him Right, you bring a lot to the role to make him likable. So, and Absolutely. Telling and well, he's you know, it's funny, like I you know, I keep thinking about you know 
ways that he mirrors Christopher and everything, because, you know, even though he died when Chrissy was a kid and everything there, inevitably weird things pass on, you know, through generations. And I think this is true to life. Like, you know, weird genetic things pass on. And, and the thing that like he really shares with Chrissy, which is, I think the thing that makes both those characters so lovable, even though they're such a mess is that they both have these kinds of fantasies of being like heroic for doing something like good, you know, or, or noble or artistic, or like they've got this kind of like weird sort of artistic soul that's buried in this totally like, you know, unsophisticated verging on idiotic, <laughs> you know, character. Yes. Yes, and, that, uh, yeah. and you know, there's something so kind of like heartbreaking about that because you kind of feel like with both of them, if they'd like grown up somewhere else or you know had some other kind of experience, that uh, you know they would have veered off on some other course, and that there's some like weird echoing thing in their head saying like you know there's this other sort of world out there for you. And they can't quite sort of make out what it's saying, you know. That's kind of how I see it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, that was the thing that I really always liked about playing Christopher was, A, exactly what you just articulated. Also, the fact that he actually worked really hard, uh, not so efficiently, but worked really hard towards those things. He actually did the work, you know. It wasn't like he was just expecting it to... You know, everyone has a great story and they always, I got a great story, if only I could write. But he actually sat his ass in a chair and bought a computer and tried to figure out how to write a script and, you know, yeah. produce a thing. That, that, that kind of striving, um, I think, was very, a, a really great, great quality for the character to have. And um, Yeah, and there's, a, well, in Christie's case, there's always something so appealing about somebody who's like relatively uneducated, um, you know, wanting to be a storyteller and having like a kind of need to to be a storyteller and like that's like there's something beautiful about that you know and that's uh and in 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 dickie's case (laughs) i don't think he ever really does turn his hand to anything particularly noble except his desire to kind of be this surrogate parent to tony and he wants to be a good guy too. It seems, you know. Yeah, just, yeah. I mean, he says, like, world, you know? he says he says like you know to Ray at one point in the thing. He says, "I want to do a good deed," you know. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ray's like, "Well, what?" <laughs> he's like, "Go, you know, a good deed." Like he sort of sheepishly admits that that's you know something that he's kind of been thinking about. The Leslie Odom uh, Jr. and you, you guys had great chemistry he's a great character yeah you guys got along real good you seem like you were friends yeah it was interesting i mean the well i i always the way i was playing it and i don't know if a lot of this didn't really make it in because stuff was was cut but you know i i felt like he and i had gone to high school together he probably was like one of the first generations of black people to go to high school with white people at that time in that air, you know, in that area. And uh, so we'd known each other and like played football together and stuff. And um, my rapport with him is probably pretty like easy, pretty like friendly and everything until I'm around, you know, the other guys in particular, my dad. And there's like one scene at Satriali's where, you know, he comes in, And he's got money for me or whatever. And like my dad is there. And whenever my dad is there, you know, I feel like that sort of the 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 sort of I'm scared of him and I want to impress him. And I and so I like am particularly kind of nasty to to Leslie's character in a kind of condescending racist way under the gaze of my dad, you know. And and if he hadn't been there you know, I'd be with him the way I am in the first scene where I like offer to, you know, give him a cigarette and we have a smoke together, you know? And so like, I always imagine that there's sort of two 
that I have two versions of my relationship with him. You know, one one that's uh, our, if, if we were in private and then the other one where I'm aware of like being around everybody else and it gets well hard. it was well done well done my friend and i couldn't thank you enough for coming on uh and like it's michael a brilliant said, performance man really michael I, said I, you should be nominated i agree totally i think you will be i'm crime. not that you, i think you definitely will be a fucking crime so i, I wish it were up to you guys <laughs> it should be best of luck to you I, i'm really good luck man i'm really glad everyone gets to see you shine here so Thank hey. you very much. <laughs> All right, brother. All right, you see guys you take care. Thank Great. you very much. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Thank see you. Bye. Right. See you, man. The great Alessandro Navola. Great talking to him. And he did do a great job in this movie. And uh, really, really great really job. Really it was great man. having him. We'll be right back. Really. Paradigm of yours is pretty cold. Yeah, well, they're hot. I fell off a truck. Far out, man. Oh. Ten inch woofers. I want to go to college. I can't get caught like this. Hey, my friend Hesh says only goys and children pay retail. This isn't wholesale, it's totally on the arm. You want to be a civilian, I appreciate that. I'm all for it. But pay attention to me for once, okay? You take the speakers, right? At the same time, you promise yourself these speakers are in. And you say to yourself, this is the last time I'm ever going to steal something. And you stick to it. It's that simple. All right, Michael, this next... All right. Guess we know him since he was a baby. I first met him when he was a tiny infant, believe it or not. A baby, yeah. Um, yeah, pretty amazing. Um, and now he has uh, appeared in eight different films and TV series, including The Deuce, Ocean's 8, the upcoming Cherry, which is based on a really great book that I loved uh, by, I think his name is Nick, Nico Walker. Uh, I'll have to ask Michael that. Um, and of course, plays the young Tony Soprano in The Many Saints of Newark. Please welcome Michael Gandolfini. Hey, hey. There he is. Oh, All grown hey, up. How are you doing, right. pal? I know. It's pretty surreal. Pretty surreal. How old are you now? 22? 22. 22. Yeah. 22 years old. Gee. Yeah. So, Michael, let me ask you. When did you decide you wanted to act? Did you know when you were younger I mean, uh, you know, uh, when did when did you decide I'm going to try this? Well, I mean, I had always loved sort of like making movies and um, I always loved watching movies. Like I was the kid who was going to like play monster in the playground rather than like play football. So I, I had always really enjoyed it. Um, I had always wanted to. um I, I kind of felt I just it, I got a lot of joy from it my whole life. Like I even remember like all my friends that grew up with people in the industry or something found like set so boring. And I always found it so just incredible. I loved just watching people act. I loved going to set. I, I always loved it. And when I moved to L.A., like most of my friends didn't really do that. It was kind of, it, they played sports. So I kind of let it go. I moved to LA for middle school and high school and started to play sports. And then college came around the idea of kind of like, where are you going to go to college? Are you going to go back? I, I knew I wanted to go back to the East coast. Um, but I, I wasn't totally sure where, and I was like, well, what about NYU? I'll go to the film program. And um, a family friend was like, okay, well, the drama, like, do you want to go for the drama program or the, you know, filmmaking? And I didn't really know. So I went to an acting class to sort of say like, oh, I hate it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it to kind of <laughs> exit out. But I went and, um, and just kind of got hooked. Yeah. So did you do, did you study f directing and filmmaking as well? Just pretty strictly acting at NYU? <laughs> So I 
junior year decided I'm going to go to film to acting school. Um, and I, the class that I went to, to like discover acting, I, I stayed in for a long time. So I gave up sports. I, I quit football, um, and soccer and all the things I was doing. And my whole school was pissed that I wasn't playing sports anymore because I was like the center and I could, you know, snap the ball pretty well. Um, and so I was going to classes cons- like a lot I was starting to do I did the school musical for the first time met a whole new group of friends and uh then really started to train um before NYU and I went to NYU for acting and uh within um probably like three months I I I left I just didn't I'm a big people person. Like I love acting because I get to like talk to people and meet people and express relationships. And, um, I just, it wasn't the place for me. So I left and ended up going to Gallatin and through Gallatin, I've studied more directing and, you know, uh, cinematography and sort of like screenwriting and the ideas that come with film history and noir classes and all that amazing stuff. So, you no, know, I did a student film, an NYU film. I was, I didn't go to NYU, I didn't go to college, but I <laughs> answered an ad in backstage, probably in the mid 80s. And it was an <clears throat> NYU student film. And Alan Taylor was the sound man, the boom operator. No way. <laughs> That's incredible. When, when he came onto the set of The Sopranos, I, I immediately recognized him. And this is like probably, uh, you know, like 15, 14 years later. I was like, you did the NYU. <laughs> Boom goes, yeah. I was like, I was the actor in that. It was so weird. I, he's kind of very distinctive looking. You know? Totally, totally. That is hysterical. Yeah, pretty funny. Wow. Um, oh, Michael, so you, the, your first kind of big thing was the Deuce, which you were very good in. I, I actually watched every episode of that series. I liked it a lot. Thank and you. Uh, you played Chris Bauer's son. Yeah. He's a great I, actor. He's a great actor and a nice guy. I met him with you. At a Ranger game. Yeah. I really like, you know, and, and, and I really liked what you did there and what he did. And it seemed like, was he a help to you? It seemed like he was trying to help you. Yeah. I mean, he, he uh, has sort of become um, an incredible, incredible part of my life um, as a mentor and a friend and sort of this father figure um in a lot of ways he's really really become that um yeah i had no clue what i was doing you know like i i i still I, don't know what i'm doing exactly like i i exa- <laughs> i i literally have no idea but back then i i didn't even really know what a mark was and i i, I you know i it's it was funny it almost like growing up on set did it a little bit of a disservice because I was like, oh, I know what sets like, you know what I mean? I was like, I know what it's like, but it's so much different when you're in front of the camera. Because yes. I mean, like, I even remember when I started, like, when everyone would be like, quiet, rolling. It was so weird for me to be talking during that time because, like, my dad and you guys had ingrained, like, when you roll, you don't speak. Because as a kid, like, my dad didn't want me screaming, you know, on set and ruin a take. So it was so ingrained in me to be quiet that, like, talking during rolling was such a weird experience for me. Um, So, you know, Chris, though, sort of taught me... um, I mean, how to just, he, 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 oh, more than anything, he trusted me. He treated me like a full blown professional and, and really just always listened to me and asked me questions and really just guided me and believed in me through the whole process. Um, one of the like most memorable experience I've ever had was, um, in the third season, I, there was a break where like I did a bunch of, so there's eight episodes or something like that. And I had done like one, two, three, and four, and then saints started during episode five. So the deuce 
David Simon, who's incredible, and George Pelicanos and Nina, they all worked it around like, all right, we Joey will leave for two seat for two episodes, and then you'll come back um, during Saints. We'll like work it out with the schedule. So I left for about two months um, while doing Saints, and then I went back, and it was such a weird experience to be in Tony for two months and then like completely do a different character, like on a TV show, especially because they're so like they're, they're both from New York. So there's like similar traits, but there's specific things that are different. And in the scene, I'm like pitching Chris Bauer, a uh, basically Viagra. I'm pitching him to buy Viagra. Um, And the way Joey spoke, was so different than Tony. It was much more in some ways educated. Um, and I just couldn't get it. I couldn't like, I just, the more I, I had it memorized, but the words just kept getting stuck. Like I was having such a trouble transitioning from Tony and I started to panic. I hadn't had that before. I'd never like really like caught up a day for that long. And I was like freaking out and, and I was apologizing and I kept going and kept stumbling And Chris was like, stop. And he put out his finger and he said, touch my finger. And I just like had to stop and just touch his finger. And it like just immediately calmed me. Like I was just panicking and he was just like, you're fine. Like, you know, it just relax. And like, we got the day done. He just was always there for me, always knew how to help me. And he has been for the past, you know, four years of my life or three years of my life. Yeah. Take, take us through a little bit of how Many Saints happened for you. Like, what was the series of events, uh, you know, leading up to it? Yeah, well, I had heard about it. Um, I sort of just was like, great, That's that'll be super excited and was happy for everyone, but really didn't expect or think or really it wasn't that I didn't want to be a part of it. I just, it wasn't a thought. It just wasn't a thought. I was actually in an acting class when I found out um, funny enough, like about to go on stage when I found out. Um, And um, then we got a call. I think the first thing I heard was like, there's a young Tony. There's like a a nine-year-old Tony. And I was like, okay, cool. Like I obviously can't play a nine-year-old Tony. And then maybe a couple of days later, we heard there's going to be an older Tony and they would like you to audition. Um, And, you know, I don't remember the moment or the feeling, but I just remember my instinct was like no i just don't i i don't think i don't well, it's everything i don't think i can do it what if i'm not good enough that's going to be super tough with like making my own career and that's a lot of pressure and you know it's a big character to play blah 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 but um my manager at the time was like you you know you don't get to say no to auditions like you you haven't gone in front of Doug Abel yet He's a great casting director in New York. You are an upcoming New York actor, so you're going to go for him. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have the part. And that helped me. That was in in some ways sort of how I got through the whole experience was like these little biteable chunks of like, oh, okay, it's an audition. And then after the first audition, like, oh, okay, get the part. Okay, now I have the part. Like, what do I need to do? Okay, watch the show. Oh, and then there's just like these little goals that I could set for mm-hmm. myself that I wanted to do that kind of helped me instead of like thinking about the big picture. So I auditioned two or maybe three times. I'm not totally sure. And I started watching the first season um, through that process to get kind of acquainted to the character. And then, um, and then David called me after the day of my audition and he said, uh, he said, Hey, look, it's going to be a while, but you did great. 
and you shouldn't worry. Um, I remember that was what he called and told me. It's going to make you worry even more. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's right? horrible. I know. I know. It's going to be a while, but don't I worry. Know. What does that mean? You did great, and it's going to be a while. So, Well, did I, I get thought, the fucking thing in it? Well, that's wrong. Shit. That was like October, and I was like, fuck. So, like, months go by, <laughs> months go by. And also, the thing is, like, I'm, like, not – I'm watching the first season. It's such an emotional experience. Like, it's intense. And I'm not allowed to tell anyone, like, anyone. I told my mom. I told my mom. That's it. And everyone's like, why are you so angry all the time? <laughs> why are you so, like – everyone kept being like, what is, like – there's something, like, you're so – because I, I, I do get – um it, it gets inside of you. I mean, as you guys know, you know, it gets. But, but you were getting so close. And the, the, a lot of times, or most of the time, when you get that close, now you really fucking want it. Yeah. You know, well, that's, that's, what why, happened. that's why you had that. You know? Exactly. After the first or second time, I started to think, oh, I, I found my way in. Like, oh, I see what I want to do here with this. Tony, um, and then, and then what cemented it actually was when I did the audition with David, David had, uh, a scene that he was, that was in the movie and then it was taken out of the movie and then it was in the movie. And he was like, I just want to hear it out loud. Can you read this? So I'd never seen the scene. I didn't prepare it. And I read it and I was just like, I know exactly what to do. Like, I, I just like, I know. And that's when I was kind of like, okay, I, I can play this part. I do know what I'm, what this Tony, how he thinks, how he acts, how he sits. And that was when I really wanted it. And then David said, it's going to be a while. <laughs> and when did you find out? Now you had, before that question, you never watched the show. Mm -mm. I had never seen the show until you started auditioning. I'd seen the pilot. I'd seen the pilot a few times in different scenarios, but I had never watched the full the full thing in any regard, and probably like only the pilot. I got a call from Rispoli. I think you guys were watching it on the set, you and Franco and Rispoli, right? On yeah, TV. yeah. Well, that's what that's what ended up happening was when I got it, I was like, "There's no fucking way I'm watching this thing by myself." Like it one, it's so fun to watch it with people because it's funny and amazing and like it was just too intense. So yeah, the the cast of the deuce like embraced me. We all watched it together, like Franco and Rispoli and Bauer and um Daniel Saul. Like we all would just get together and, and watch it. Um and it was kind of like I would I would watch it um, for like information and also just kind of get an emotional purge and then go home and I would rewatch the episodes and I had three I had three books I had a history book so one whenever they talk about the past to understand a timeline what's happened to me before or where are we going. And then I had a, um, um, it was like a character book of just all the different familial ties. I had, I had a family tree and then I had a mob family tree um, because there's so much folklore and I know how important it is to fans as you obviously know. Um, and I, I wanted to know my stuff. And then I also had um, sort of like, you know, like Melfi's notebook of like these sort of really important moments for Tony, whether my dad made a choice that I felt was very important and specific and informative or talked about something about the past that was really important. So I would go back and sort of like write in those three notebooks. Were there moments watching the show that were really just hard? Yeah, totally. Um, there is for me. Was I didn't watch it since it was initially aired. Yeah. You know, and part of it was because after Jim passed, I, I didn't want to go there. So re-watching yeah. it for this show, there were times where it's just it's just hard, you know, and you miss you, it you is. I just miss him. 
period, you know. And, you know, and Michael, it was, first of all, you did a great job in the movie. But I got to I gotta be honest, you know, you were, it's like a sports guy, you know, like, so your father is revered and rightfully so, respected actor, one of the best ever. And then you're coming up, it's kind of like being LeBron James's son or Shaq's son or, or Mickey Mantle's son. And now you're going to go into that same business. It's not easy what you're doing. And I really commend you for that because it's hard in those foot, footsteps. I'm going to be honest. And, you know, and then you go into many saints and they throw you in the deep end of the pool. Yeah. It's tough what you did. You got big balls, my friend. <laughs> my father would be proud of you. Thank you. Well, first of all, you know, that means that means more than you'll know coming from you guys. You guys are always family to me. You've always been family to me. And and I love you guys like family. Um, so so thank you, you know. Yeah, you know, like it came to be so the you know, first, yeah, there are moments where it's it's hard because there are moments the show's so fun and it's so good that you get wrapped up in it and then something happens and you're like, oh, or like the air is sucked out of the room. Um, you know, any of his kids stuff is tough. Meadow um, comes home one night and, and sees Tony and he says, you know, I love you. And that's tough. Also knowing the kind of acting my dad did and just sort of like sensory and using his life like i know that he it's like him talking to me um that's tough robert eiler's tough when he comes and brings the pizza in and he says you know i'm so proud to be your dad that one always gets me and then for the most part the rest is okay until he gets shot in the stomach. I find the hospital stuff very hard for me to watch uh, yeah. when he's when he's sick. Um, that stuff is tough. But you know, I I'm I would consider myself hopefully somewhat of like a Sopranos pro, watching it so many times and like getting the history down. But it's only really through one through four. Because after that, there's a major shift between season four and five. It yeah. gets a lot darker. A lot. Um, my dad gets a lot darker. And his accent changes where, like, he has a, you know, if he has an S and he kind of has a lisp, he starts to go with the SH. He kind of talks with the, I can't do it, with the SH. Well, you just did it a little. I just saw you. <laughs> yeah. 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 So when you did that. I, I was like. When I watched it, I was like, oh, I don't want to do the SH thing because he does that later on when he's kind of older. So, like, I want to keep it. So, like, I watched one through four because it's just a little lighter and a little younger and his accent's a little more of what I wanted to do. So I've probably seen season five and six only maybe only once. You know, it's really funny. One day he he said, come here, I want to show you something. So I go in his trailer and he had a video. Back then we had videotapes still. Uh -huh. So he puts this video in and David had cut all these scenes where they couldn't understand what Jim was saying. And it was right around then, like just stuff that like it could say really quick, like, you know, what am I gonna do? You know, like whatever it was, but it was like 10 things in a row. Yeah. And we started laughing hysterically because neither one of us could understand it either. <laughs> That's fucking hysterical. It was really funny. And then he was like, yeah. I gotta start paying attention to what the fuck I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. As he wasn't aware that he was doing it. No, totally. It does. He, he, his performance fully changes. And, uh, I think, I think, th was that the year you went on hiatus? That's what I yeah. always guess. Yeah. That's so he came break. back and like fucking yeah. forgot. <laughs> you know, uh, what your father would do before the season started. And I went with him a few times. He would say, let's go down, have dinner in little Italy. Mm -hmm. I want to get back into you know, not that there's mobsters around, but there's still a few hanging around, you know. Totally. It's different, but he would say, eh, let me get back into that, uh, you know, in that mold. And he would go down there just like when he played a cop, he rode with the cops and, you know, you know, goes to the precinct. And yeah. I think, where did, where did he go to the morgue and shit? You know, he got his feet wet there. That's, that's yeah, what that's he's doing. 
that's some of my favorite stuff to do too like doing this is awesome lit we went to, i went to little italy a bunch i actually went and lived in newark for two days i did it um in this like horrible hotel which is such a crazy experience really um, yeah i love that i love that mostly because not only does it inform a character so much and I was up against it, as you said, of like, I need to create my own thing. Was And the thing is to like, I look a lot like my dad, but it also took some work to like, know how to how, like, how to hold his body and how to look like he always looks with his eyes and like how to hold my face and how to use my hands like that all I had to develop all that because that wasn't really in my blood so like that was one aspect of it and then there was the other aspect you're talking about which was so fun of like going and and, and doing all this stuff there's this beautiful church in newark that was built um from all these stonemasons um like italian immigrants that came over so i went there and um was that the museum the saint lucy's that had the museum in the basement yeah, <laughs> yeah alessandro, about- alessandro went there too um, yeah he told us about that what yeah. was that- the biggest challenge for you playing in this role hmm. the biggest challenge um uh you know what the biggest challenge was easily um i after i had spent so much time sort of developing how to hold my face and my body and the way tony reacts to things because that's important like that's one of the things like he 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 reacts so physically that I knew if I could really play him physically well, the audience would understand what Tony's feeling because yeah. there's been 86 hours of him. So we know how he reacts. So once I got that down, what was the hardest part was I play like 17 in the movie. I was 19. I turned 20 um, during it. And Anger is really easy for me. And Tony, I, I understood his triggers. Like I understood breaking the phone. I understood like when he lifts you up in the pilot, like one of the things Alan helped me so much with was like, bring it back. Like he's not Tony Soprano yet. He's not angry yet. You cannot you snap at your dad like that. He will not like, you know what I mean? Like you're not that guy yet. You're still a sensitive, quiet, curious, young kid. So like pulling it back and pulling the reins back, that was one of the toughest things to actually do. Um, because well, you did it. You, you definitely did it because <laughs> you captured the, there is something very youthful and young and like the that sweet side that he always had yeah as an as an adult but you know um like you said that that whole that a, that anger and violence is not totally like in the forefront of his psyche yet right no did you know, did you know alan taylor no i hadn't and, and that was the thing we had worked on too is like it he starts very sensitive almost nerdy and like it grow the anger grows that you know as it goes on but I hadn't known Alan. I obviously, of course, knew David, um, but we hadn't been that close. When I moved back to New York to start college, I reconnected with David um, and me and Denise and him got got lunch, um, which is great. But I had, I, you know, I, I'm sure I met Alan on set, but not to my knowledge ever. So it was kind of like meeting him for the first time was when after my first or second audition, I met him. Uh, so what's this new project you got? Tell me about that. Cherry? Guess, well, no. Cher- so Cherry came out um, a few months ago um, on Apple. Um, but I just went and did a movie. Um, I have a small part in Ari Aster's next movie. And he did. He directed Hereditary and Midsummer and these, like, psychological um kind of horror thrillers um, with Joaquin Phoenix. And, oh, my God, it was such an incredible, incredible experience. It was, it was, um, yeah, just like boot camp and and so challenging. And uh, 
so fun. It was a highly emotional, intense scene. Um, we shot nights in Saints, but never like this was like 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. This is like a real, a real night. And it was my first full night shoot um, over two days. And um, oh, it was so fun. I just I learned Your so father much. father was friendly at Joaquin Phoenix. They, were yeah, they, they did a movie. How about this? My dad, Chris Bauer and Joaquin Phoenix did a movie together. Oh, did they? And then Nick Cage was the fourth. So I got to do a movie with Nick Cage. And then I did, I've worked with everyone from 8mm, which is like a movie. Yeah. yeah. I remember, I remember, I think it was at the SAG Awards, he introduced me to Joaquin Phoenix. He was such a nice guy and just such a, a pro. And like, look, you know, like, I mean, at 22 years old, like, it's about working with those people. Like, David Simon, the Russos, David Chase, John Bernthal, Alessandro, Vera, and Corey, and, you know, like, getting to work with those people, like, I just learned so much, and and that's, that's what I want to do, you know, like, I think when I think about, you know, it is a tough, it's a tough thing, especially when I did this, you know, like, people sometimes ask me, what do you think about the nepotism thing, but I, I live my life kind of in action. Like if you act like a piece of shit, you're a piece of shit, no matter what you say. If you act like a good guy, you're a good guy. Like I kind of say like, just watch the movie, like watch what I do. If you think I suck in it, then maybe I did. But if you think I'm good, there you go. Let it speak for itself. Oh, fuck you know? With their nepotism bullshit. I'm all for nepotism. <laughs> I wish my father could have helped me. He was a shit bag. <laughs> Uh, but uh, listen to me. You stay on the course. You're a good boy. You did a great job in the movie. Yes, sir. We love you, and thank Thanks you so for much. Thank you on Michael. the show. No, thank yeah, you, guys. This is incredible. I really All right, man. All right, love you guys. Care of love I'll you. See you. Bye. Bye. There Michael you go. The great, Gandafini. great talking to him. Great, He's the great young Tony Soprano. Many Saints in Newark will be. We'll be seeing a lot more of Michael Gandolfini, I'm sure. We'll be right back. Fresh from his nap. Jordan, Jordan. Yeah. He hasn't met Johnny. Aww. Wow. Johnny, huh? this is our Christopher. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Christopher Moltisanti. It's your Uncle Johnny. I'm back from England. <laughs> Where's your daddy? Come here. Oh, Bumbolino. Finally, huh? Corrado. Right? Got myself a son. Hi. I hear he's slow with the talking. Hi, Christopher. Hello. Oh, what's the matter? Don't cry. It's only me, your Uncle Tony. Oh. What's wrong, Gucci Go? Oh, oh. Okay, all right, all right. You know, every time you hear him, he cries like this. I didn't do anything. Oh, what happened? Okay? Look at that. I don't know what it is. It's like a scam or something. Some babies, when they come into the world, know all kinds of things from the other side. This next guest played, of course, one of my favorite characters. Yeah, this, uh, uh, this actor delivered one of my favorite performances in the film, I must say. I was really, I, I was very impressed with what he did, and I enjoyed it was fun to watch him. As, as was I. He's an award-winning actor. Grew up in New York City on the Upper West Side where you live. Yes. Uh, he's appeared in over 67 different films and TV shows. He's great in Billions, which you know I like. He was great in The Deuce, Girls, The Strain, House of Cards. And he plays one of my favorite soprano characters in The Many Saints of Newark. Uncle Junior, please uh, welcome Corey Stoll. There he Howdy. is. Hello, sir. What's happening, How's pal? I assume you're in New York City right now. I am. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm in Brooklyn now. Very nice. Uh, and listen, were you a big Soprano fan growing up? Yes, very much. I, uh, you know, I watched it all while it was happening. And then when my son was born, my, my wife was pregnant about five years ago. She hadn't seen it. So we watched it all during her pregnancy. Uh, and then when I was cast, I watched it all over again. Um, and it's just, it, it just gets better and 
So, and I, never in a gazillion years when you watched it the first time did you say, someday I'm going to be <laughs> a junior. <laughs> no, I didn't. It's got to be surreal uh, a little bit. Yes. How, how did it come that. about? How did the uh, getting getting involved in Many Saints of Newark come about? Uh, you know, I, I my agent said there's, you know, there might be a part in this Sopranos prequel coming up. And I I, I didn't even know that there was one uh, uh, in development or anything. And I said, yeah, you know, I am assuming I'll play, you know, third FBI agent from the left or something. Um, <laughs> and then <laughs> they sent me the script and I started reading it and I realized they still hadn't told me who I was playing. And then I... I I, uh, I sent a text hoping that I was right, that it was Junior and it was. Wow. And you didn't have to audition, right, Corey? I didn't, no. You didn't have to read. Thank, thank God, because I wouldn't have gotten it. I mean. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> I read in an interview that you did recently that you did a scene and then you were looking over to David Chase kind of to, uh, you know, Get him giving you the thumbs up or the okay sign, which is not happening in a million fucking years. <laughs> Well, I think he may. Have, I think he may have mellowed a little bit since you guys were working with him. Uh, you know, he 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 was. Uh, I, you know, I, I, it's a bit of a high wire act bringing all these characters back because it's sure. like, how do you do it? Do you, you know, how much leeway do you give each actor? How much is that every actor sort of cast by how they look and sound, and how much do they bring it themselves? And I think that was something that we were all figuring out as we went along. Um, yeah. and, and he, luckily I felt like he, he gave, he gave me a, a long leash. And did, uh, you still got to stick to the script? Does he give you a little leeway to ad lib a little bit or no? You know, I, I, I bet he, he, he might have if I had tried, but you know, it, it's junior. Like, I don't, I don't know how I could possibly ad lib junior. Yeah. It was well written and you just, you didn't really need to elaborate at all. Yeah. Yeah. I felt that way. So what was your uh, approach? How did you tackle, you know, the uh, taking on the role of Corrado Soprano? Well, you know, I I watched the whole thing over again, which was an incredible experience because I did, I think it was like all 86 episodes in like six weeks or something, which I don't recommend. It's a little, it's a little stressful. Sure. uh, (laughs) Just do the whole arc of the series in that short period of time. And then the... uh, our, the dialect coach really helpfully made this like supercut of all of his, all the times he tells a joke. Mm. And, and I just listened to that. Yeah. yeah. And he's a great joke teller. They're not terribly politically correct jokes, but they're, <laughs> they're funny. And, they're, and he's a great joke teller. And he, there's, it, it, it contains everything, it, you know, all, all of his rhythms in, in, in those jokes. That was, I thought, the most important thing to capture about about Junior. He has this this unique and dynamic rhythm where he has this real staccato thing and this very sort of lyrical um, sort of rhythm as well. And uh, you know, he's not. You know, I'm not playing him as an old man. That was the real challenge. Was yeah. who is this guy who was passed over by his younger brother? Um, you know, who is he when he still has a chance to be the guy? Um, right. and, and, and what is it about him that made his younger brother his boss? I think that's really key to his personality. Yeah, his delivery is very specific. Uh, Dominic's, you know, and in, in, in the role, it's like, I, I agree with you. It's like everything about that character is contained in that delivery. The bitterness, the, you know, the strength, the kind of the uh the regret and the you know the anger all that stuff is is, is in there it's it's quite fascinating um did you so you 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 it's almost like a mathematical problem right you have the, the the solution is junior played by dominic and you have to kind of like do the long division and get back to the <laughs> components of what what made him i guess it's is interesting yeah yeah i mean luckily i did have to do all that work you know uh you know it, it was in the script so it's not like you know if i it's, it's not like i had to add that which i i just i don't think i would have felt terribly comfortable doing because it you know it, you got david chase there to write it so 
Yeah. So I really, you know, it was like I did all that work and then I just tried to throw it away and just do the the words that were in front of me. Uh, did you get to talk to Dominic Kianese? I didn't. I didn't want to. I didn't want to bother him. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it bothered him. You just wanted to do it. You, you felt better. You don't want uh, to. Do. I mean, you know. I don't know. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a unique situation where you know he, perf- you know, he did a perfect job. He he created this character from soup to nuts, and nailed it. You know beyond my dreams and here i'm coming in doing my thing and i just felt like i'll let his work stand for itself and i'll do my thing and i i hope i i still haven't spoken with him or met him but i hope i can uh soon but i didn't i didn't want to bother him and he'll love what you did he's a great guy and he will love it you know we're we've been doing this podcast for like a over you know a year almost a year and a half we're in a lot of we're in contact with a lot of fans and they are eagerly awaiting this movie i mean it's like yeah. they are you know chomping at the bit for this what um what do you think uh will surprise the fans what do you think will sat- what satisfy them what's your you know what's your take on that well you know it's interesting and I th- and, and uh you know i've seen that david chase has alluded to this himself so i'm not uh i don't think you know breaking any uh, embargo or anything, but like the, the, the marketing of the film is, 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 is one aspect of the film, you right. know, it's really marketed as the, you know, as Tony Soprano's story and that's in there, but the story is about Dickie Moltisanti, right. you know, it's, 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 it's another story that, that is in the same world and interacts with the Sopranos that we know. Right. Um, and I think that's, I think that's the strength of it. You know, I think it's, it's, you know, as you guys know, there's, there's a lot of Easter eggs. There's a lot of, you know, for the, for the real yeah. deep Sopranos fans, there's a lot of references and answers to questions that you might've had. And, you know, you get to see scenes that were described in the, in the series, the mythology. Yeah. 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 Um, and I definitely won't spoil any of that here, but like the story is a gangster story about Dickie Moltisanti. Right. And it stands alone. It stands for itself. Yeah. yeah. yeah it stands and by Alessandro itself. Alessandro did a terrific job. Terrific yeah. job. Yeah. Very good. And I think it's good that, like you're saying, it stands on its own because Dickie, you know, he's mentioned in the series, but not that much. We don't really know. We, we don't know much about him at all. We know a little bit from what Christopher says and Tony mentions him a few times. But in the movie, we really get to know him, which I think yeah. is I think is one of its strengths, because um, to just focus on the characters that we know, even though they're younger now, I think would have been even more of a high wire act than mm-hmm what what they you know what everybody manages to pull off um so i i agree with you and it's it 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 works for that reason and uh, listen Corey, i know you got a million interviews to do thank you very much for joining us and you were terrific and i'm sure the movie's gonna do great and i uh can't wait to watch it again and and thanks man nice meeting you it, yeah great to meet you guys too and you know thanks for all your work in the original series just you know best ever well, thank you. you're going to make a lot of fans happy. That's for yeah. sure. Really appreciate it. You did a great job. And thank you, man. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care. We'll see Take you. Care. Corey Stoll, who plays the young Corrado Soprano Jr., Uncle Jr., in The Many Saints of Newark. Great, great actor. He did a great job, and uh, I enjoyed talking to him. So this next guy is a good guy. I did a reading of a play with him. He's, he's a really good guy. And he worked with David on David's other movie. David's only done two movies, uh, Not Fade Away and Now Many Saints. And uh, John was in both. He's born in Akron, Ohio. He's appeared in over 50 different films and TV series, including The Big Short, Orange is the New Black, Lansky, The Good Wife, Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan. Uh, and uh, he plays Silvio Dante, and he does a fantastic job in uh, Many Saints of Newark. Please say hello to John Maguero. Hey, guys. There he is. 
How you doing, pal? Hi, Hi John. Good to be here with you guys. Are well, you in Ohio well. now or New York? I'm in Brooklyn. I'm in. Oh, you yeah, live in I, I don't go back. I don't go back to Ohio that much. Uh-huh. I try to avoid it at all costs. <laughs> hey. It's, oh, yeah. It was a fine place to grow up, but, uh, you know, when you have a long weekend, it's not the place you want to spend time. So you've been in New York for a while? Yeah, uh, I've been I've been in New York now for, uh, I want to say, 16, 16 years. Oh, okay. That's a long time. So it's, uh, you know, home, wife, kid here. So if you hear something I, screaming, that's the baby. It's all right. How, if you hear uh, screaming, it's my wife. Oh, uh, there you go. Or he's screaming at me. <laughs> <laughs> that happens a lot on this. What, um, how did you uh, what, tell us your journey out for many saints? Like how this, uh, we know you worked with David on Not Fade Away, but how how did this one come about? This role? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I, I've been a fan. I, I watched you guys. You know, it's really, it's really, you know, I've got, I've, over the years, I've gotten to meet a lot of you guys and Michael and you, meeting you for the first time. But I, that show is one of the things that inspired me to, to get into this business. Um, I had your poster on my wall. As a, as a, at high school, I started watching and I would have been, I think, 15 at the time it aired, 16, 15, 16 when it aired. It took me all the way through my first year here in New York. You guys did your final season. So, I, I mean, I watched it religiously. So oh. when I finally got the chance to work with David on Not Fade Away, that was a real, you know, that was a real treat. Um, had a really great time. We really bonded, became really close and tight with him. But the first time he told me about Many Saints, because, you know, I never thought this was going to happen as a fan and also knowing David, I just didn't think he was going to go back to it, but he told me about it. It was his 50th wedding anniversary with Denise. So we were at dinner at his restaurant on the Upper East Side and his producing partner, Nicole, sort of like whispered in my, in my ear, you're not going to believe this, asked David what he's up to. So I asked David what he was working on and he goes, I'm going to do a Sopranos movie. And I thought he was bullshitting me. You know, I thought it was it was like, like I, I think I laughed at it like it was a joke. And I was like, OK, now what's the real thing you're going to do? And he's like, no, I'm doing it. I'm going to do a prequel. Uh, and uh, I didn't hear about it for a while. I didn't think I didn't know I was going to be a part of it at that point. I was excited for it. And uh, it, as it got closer, you know, they had to look for the kid. That was really important. So when they found Michael, things started to really fall into place because that was a big hunt. And uh, then they started mentioning, would you be willing to be bald? And then my mind starts racing, who the hell could I be playing? Who, who could he be interested in me playing who's bald? And I didn't know until I got the, uh, it got really close. They were like, you got to come in because Alan Taylor wants you, you know, he wants to see you read. They're not going to just give this to you. So they sent me the sides. It was a couple scenes from the show. I think one of them was the scene, um, when uh, Steven confronts Jim about, you know, they got to whack Steve Buscemi's character and like they've been putting this off and he's sort of like, and he's like, I've, I've known you for years. You get, you know, you got to, you're stubborn, you don't send the authority. Great so scene. Was, yeah. yeah, it's a great scene. And it really yeah. showcases Steven in it. So yeah. I, that's, I think, a reason they picked it. They picked another scene. I'm, I'm ha- that one's escaping me. I really remember that one. So wait, you auditioned f- with scenes from the series, not from the movie? Not from the movie. That's, That's so weird. weird. From this, so weird, right? So weird. I don't know if everyone did that. I assume like Billy, myself, maybe Vera. Like I think like like we probably all kind of that did that. I think even some of the other people just had you know how they give those dummy sides out now that are just maybe like- Corey too. Well, Corey didn't audition. I don't. No, think. he didn't audition. Didn't Alessandro. Uh, he they gave him the sides of the movie right because yeah. there was not nothing else for him to do but that's really wild yeah so i went in the room you know it was with it was with alan and david and i'm sure david was nervous because you know he was kind of rooting for me to, to get it but alan had to see it and i could have fallen on my face uh but it went really well like i i went in and did it and alan right pretty much right away was like it's your you know this the hunt's over now um and that was it. You know, then then we were off to the races. Then now, it was now, the you worked with uh, Stevie Van Zandt on the movie, right? He did the music for Not Fade Away. So you guy, you spent a lot of time with him, I assume. Yeah, yeah. So I know I've known Stephen as long as I know David. Uh, he was, you know, because we played a rock band, you know, Jersey rock band in the '60s. Uh, 
and uh, he he was a, a producer, but he was also the, you know all the music ideas and stuff were a lot of it was his. He created the sound of the band. We recorded it at Renegade, his studio. He, I sang on it, so he you know doing the produ- producing. He guided me on the vocals and how to sound and kind of stuff like that. And we had the, the other guys in it, Jack Houston, Will Brill, and myself. We didn't play instruments, so we had to learn our instruments. So I had to learn drums. So we did three months at Renegade almost every day wow. learning those instruments. So Stephen was constantly around. It was like right when he did Lilyhammer, you know, like that's, that's when it was happening. He was going off to Norway to do Lilyhammer. And he's like, I'm doing this Netflix show. And that was before Netflix had shows. So we're like, what yeah. the fuck is this? It was crazy. And, and then, you know, and. Netflix became everything. So, so, so you for, were you uh, doing the, a version of, of Steven before? Were you just by being around him so much? Were you doing uh, his mannerisms and stuff? I no, I didn't, I didn't do I mean, you know, like you get, it gets in your head. It's very <laughs> specific how he is. How but he Silvio and Steven are very different. Yeah. And Silvio and Steven are very different. But I will say the body language of both, there's a similarity. There's a similarity there. There's some differences, but, but, there's a general rhythm with the way Sil walks and the way Steven walks. That's, that's kind of similar, but the voice and, you know, all that stuff. But you know, what's funny about being bald is that there was one, they were talking about, I guess it was when he gets shot or, you know, when he's in the hospital and Dave was like, maybe we'll see Sylvia without the wig. And Steven said, Sylvia don't wear no wig. <laughs> so it goes to show, cause I didn't, you know, watching the show, I never knew he, I, you know, that he's wearing a piece, but I didn't know it was like, he was supposed to be bald and all these people, there's a lot of people on, online who are like, what the fuck? He wasn't bald, but it's like, this is David's character. He made the guy up. So if he's bald. He's bald. Yeah. But, uh, and did you study uh, a tape of uh, Silvio? I mean, because yeah. you got the walk down, you got everything down, all the mannerisms. I mean, that had to be a lot of work. That, that was yeah. not easy. Way. Well, I mean, you know, I was, you know, it's David. So I was, a thousand percent even like playing like a smaller role i was like i'm giving this everything uh before the audition i went back and started watching the show i got about four or five seasons into it before i had to go in i watched a lot of scenes online i even went back and like looked at old interviews of steven with the east street band you know from when he was more around the age that I, that I'm supposed to be in the movie, so like in his like early 30s ish. Right. So so there's a cu- there's not many, but there's a couple interviews like that, and even the way he carried himself. So I try to like mix all that stuff together, and then also just take how what I know about Stephen and 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 that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it was like a stew, just peppering it all in. Sure. Yeah. Was that the only <laughs> part you were up for? That's the only thing I auditioned. But they, they mentioned, uh, David and Nicole mentioned, they, they actually said the first time they were like talking to me about coming in was like, they said, are you willing to be bald or are you willing to gain a lot of weight? So I don't know who to gain a lot of weight, maybe pussy, but I, I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah, what. You would have to gain a lot of weight. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I could have gotten there. Yeah. But pussy didn't have all, you had, a, of all those characters, you had more than anybody else. I mean, I think that evolved over time, you know? I think that I think they they sort of kind of developed a trust for me because I know the script was still be, being worked out at before sure. we went into production and sort of figuring out who of these guy of us guys were going to do what. So um I I think I think Alan, you know, sort of trusted that I could handle it, so he 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 sort of like maybe gave me a little bit more ish or maybe David, I don't know where that came from, sure. but but it, it, it grew. And uh, have you seen Stevie since you did the role? Yeah, I had dinner with David and Stephen. Now, you know, I can't, I've lost track of time with COVID, but I want to say probably, probably the fall before COVID hit. That was the last time I saw him. Had Stephen see what you did? Yeah, so Stephen had seen a couple cuts at that point. And I was nervous as hell, you know, like, I, and I, I think I kept asking David over and over again. I was like, what does Steven say? What does Steven say? Has he seen it? What does he say? And uh, I heard from Maureen first. I heard Maureen, like, she really dug it. So that was exciting. But I was still worried about Steven. And then when I saw him at that dinner, he was really, you know, he was really kind and, and really positive about the work. So that was like, 
Yeah. That was the win, you know. To have him give his blessing for it was was a big, sure. big win. Yeah. What was the hardest part of the character to nail for you? Um, I think not going to you know remembering that this is still in the past is about 20, 30 years in the past. So so not becoming and also like if you watch go back and watch the pilot there to where Sill ends in the last season, you know, it's kind of a different guy. A lot of time has passed. The character becomes a little more pronounced because Stephen was still kind of a young man when you guys started the show, in a sense. Um, so trying not to be the sill, you know, in the episode that becomes the boss and has his, his hypochondriac panic. Asthma. Asthma, no. <laughs> which is absolutely brilliant episode. But so it was kind of balancing that. But also, I think for all of us, everyone who was playing one of these characters who, you know, one of you guys that you guys created, there was a weight. There was a, the, it was nerves. It's this kind of scary idea that you're going to let everyone down because the fans of the show are so devoted, so loyal. Oh, yeah. And so committed to it. And, um, you know, there's a few things like that. And also as a fan myself, I don't want to like, you know, I don't want to be the guy who fucks it all up. So, so I think there was just a real pressure. So that, so, so getting over those nerves and really being able to come in and do your job and focus and not make it a caricature and not make it an impression. Uh, that, that was probably the biggest challenge. Uh, you know, Silvio, as the series goes on, became one of my favorite characters. I mean, uh, you know, we watched it. You know, me and Michael have since watched that. I didn't watch it in 20 years. Watched it twice. And uh, I like Silvio's character. He was smart. He told he Tony threw. Soprano, like, what it was. I mean, I enjoyed the shit out of his character. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. It's now, very specific. Around, I don't know, but. Watching it again, he was very smart, likable, family guy. You know? Yeah, great consigliere. You know what I also liked about something about Sill that I think one of the reasons we, we, we when we discussed the idea of him being, you know, when he was bald and then him getting the toupee and like no one ever really commenting on it. Um, I think in the series, there was always more so than I think even all you guys, because like, you know, Bobby he really gets close with the family when he marries Janice. And obviously Michael, Christopher is a huge, huge part of the show. But like still, even more than like Pauly had mystery around him. You never really quite got to know him. Probably not until that episode where he becomes the boss. Do you, no. really, do you really get to like a glimpse kind of behind the curtain? Right. You know, you ne he was always sort of, distant he did his job he was professional but he was also sort of mysterious yeah um, you only know him in terms of what he does for tony kind of like you know he's married you know he got a family yeah. you know he knows you know like what he you know he runs butterbean and blah 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 but but no one like even like his like whoremongering and him like fucking all these women no one calls it like tony calls him out on it once i think like no one Christopher did at the intervention. Do, yeah, you, yeah, you do it in the intervention, right? Yeah, at the intervention, you're like, <laughs> stick your dick in every, yeah, that's <laughs> No, but you're right. I think he was kind of solid. And, yeah. and like I've said on the series a lot, John, I mean, when it came time, you know, we laugh at these guys and they're funny and Paulie and Sylvia, but when it comes time to take care of business, these guys ain't fucking around. No. Sylvia no. takes care of business. Yeah. He's told what to do, he gets it done. Yeah, you know? definitely. I think that's the other thing, you know, like, he is so smart, he's so effective, he never ends up in jail throughout the series, he does his job well, and he's also extremely ruthless. You know, like, first episode, he bombs Vesuvio. Yeah. Later, he fucking kills Drea's character. Like, he's the guy who does it. I mean, that's 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 it's, it's he's an interesting character, you know. He's really interesting. Yeah. Character. Yeah. Now you did two movies with David. Yeah. Uh, the, you, you, no ad living, no improv, and you know the the the, the drill, right? Or does he? He, like, he was a little looser. Let you go a little. He let me go a little. He let me go. He, he let me. He. I, I was. I, I think I was more strict, you know, he, the writing's so good that you don't want to, I didn't, I didn't really want to do too much anyway, 
I think on Not Fade Away, we were pretty strict about the lines, but I, it's been a while. I'm sure we did a few like improv type things, but not much. This one, like I was saying, I, I had a little more, I, I think since, since we were sort of like doing like some at times like vamp music, you know, like sort of incidental, our, our, our scenes were little comic pieces or here and there. There was a little bit more room for, for, for throwing something in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You still playing the drums? I am. I am. I am my electric <laughs> kid over here. It's the best. It's the greatest. That was such a, you know, that was so fun learning, becoming a rock band and also just being around Steven, the wealth of knowledge he has about yeah. rock and roll. And, you know, they gave us iPods with all these great songs on it. It was just, you know, it was like a crash course and all, all this great music. Yeah. Well, the fans are going to love you as Silvio. They've been uh, yes. watching this. They're going to absolutely love you. Uh, you did a great job, and, and okay. thanks for doing this, and yeah. uh, best of luck, my friend. Thank Good you. luck, and thanks for coming on the show, John. I appreciate it. catch up to you again, John. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, See you. Thanks. The great John Magaro. John Magaro plays the young Silvio Dante in The Many Saints in Newark. And I think people are going to love that. He did a great job. He's a good guy, too. Not an egomaniac like some people I know. Yeah, yeah. You know um, what I mean? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. How's it going, Arrow? Cyril, how's your... How you doing, son? Well, I'm taking my nephew to the Yankees game. Don't worry about me. something funny back here? I'm sorry, Uncle Dick. No, really, I'm sorry. I heard your ass was back in Jersey. Did you see who got that warrant over your head? Lead detective died, nobody gives you. Leon Overall had been a white boy, be a whole different story. Hey, Harold, how about you come around and talk to me over here? When are you gonna come back and work for me? Got stuff from my own percolator. Why are you waiting for that Maxwell House to boy? Okay, our next guest is an award-winning actor and dancer of both stage and screen. Made his Broadway debut at age 17 in Rent. Appeared in a number of Broadway productions, including one of the greatest ever, Hamilton, where he won a Tony Award, playing Aaron Burr. He's appeared in over 50 different films and TV series, including Red Tails, Murder on the Orient Express, Central Park, Smash. He's been nominated for two Academy Awards two Emmys, won a Grammy. Wow. We were actually nominated together for Ensemble Cast uh, this year for SAG Award for Ensemble Cast for One Night in Miami. Please welcome Mr. Leslie Odom Jr. Yo, hey. I've never, I mean, maybe for like Twinkle Toes, I've never, I've never been intro introduced as an actor and a dancer before. That is like, <laughs> I like that. I want to, I want to make sure that from now on, Okay. There you go. Well, neither of us can do that. We can't be introduced that way. <laughs> Thank you for doing this, man. Uh, first of all, you, we saw the movie, and uh, you were fantastic. I, I'm not just saying that. One, we love the movie. Two, uh, you really, really good shit. Really good stuff. I mean, you went head to head Thanks, with man. Alessandro, and it was just. That was the whole dynamic of the movie, as far as I'm concerned. So it was really, really good, and we enjoyed it. How did you get involved in uh, the Many Saints of Newark? Oh man, I got a I got a call to audition for like Project X. I don't even I I, I don't even I have to go through my email just to make sure I'm telling the truth. But I don't even think they told me it was for the Sopranos movie. You know, it was like um, you're just auditioning for this big thing. They lost an actor. I don't I don't. 
I think that's a terrible thing to say, you know, but I, you know, uh, like, like you guys before this, before the Sopranos for you, I'm, I, I'm not a first call guy yet, you know, maybe one day. I think but now think, it's coming. You know, I think that's a done that's deal, cool. my friend. <laughs> but you know, like it's, it's good to be on fucking any list, the second list, the third yeah. list. And so, you know, when, when somebody fell out, they were looking to replace the guy very quickly. And, uh, you know, they send you like, a made up script, not even, you know, some made up scenes, some made up names. And uh, they asked me to put myself on tape. Um, and and I, I, you know, I, I'm happy to do that. The interesting thing was they asked me to, they kept asking me to tape. They were like, they're going to make the decision in the next day. So you got to get this thing done tonight. They're making the decision tomorrow. And then the next day they're like, okay, can you tape again? We have some other ideas. I'm like, okay. Yeah. But you're making the decision tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's, can you tape again? Like literally two times. And so I was like, guys, you got to give me, uh, you know, a little bit more information than I have. Like, can I get a script? Can I get a conversation with the director? I don't even know what I'm auditioning for. So then I had a, a, a conversation with Alan. And um, I said all of that to say, um, even though I didn't know very much, you guys know there's something about David's writing that was inspiring me. I didn't even know my fucking character name. You know what I mean? Like I didn't even know wow. what I was playing, but there was something about these scenes that when I went to play them, um, I was um, I was inspired. So they you popped. Never, they had an energy to them, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, Leslie, you you got hired off the tape. You never met with them in person. I did. They, they after the second time they had me tape, and I had the conversation with Alan. And then they said we want to fly you to New York. And you got, you know, you probably, you guys know how it is. It's like I'd been around enough to know that I was like, look, if you guys are looking for, because when I was first told about it, they said you were making the decision tomorrow. So it felt to me like, I don't know, like, are y'all playing games or, you know, like, are you, if you're looking for a reason not to cast me, like, just don't cast me, you know, what I mean? like, why don't, you know, but, but I couldn't deny, I, I really couldn't deny that every time I picked up those scenes, you know, I was inspired. So I said, ah, they're, you know, it's on their dime. I'll fly to New York. If they don't hire me, they don't hire me. Um, and I met with Alan and David and a few hours later they called and, and invited me to join the project. Wow. That was a good phone call. Now, did yeah. you ever audition for The Sopranos? Never. No, I was, uh, I, I, I kind of, you know, missed that in its initial run. I didn't grow up in an HBO house, if you know what I mean. Like, we didn't have HBO. We had basic cable, very, very basic cable. And uh, when I was a young, you know, college student and stuff, I, did, I didn't. I didn't have it. So everybody knew who you guys were because you were so ubiquitous and on the covers of magazines and stuff like that. But I wasn't I didn't watch the show in its initial run. I've since watched it top to bottom. Where where did you grow up? I grew up in New York and, and Philadelphia. OK, so what was your character's name is Harold McBrayer in the movie? What was your way in to that character? Like, how did you approach the role? Yeah. Good question. I he reminded me a lot of my granddad, um, Lenell, Lenell Odom. People called him Lenny. Lenny was from the South. Uh, he was part of that great migration from the South to the North when when people came from the farms essentially and you know went to the North to make a better life for themselves and their children. They were going to get a factory job <laughs> uh, and get off the you know get off the farms. And so my 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 grandfather was the first in his family to do that. And he did. He put his kids through college and nursing school uh, as a, you know, as a factory worker. And there was something about Harold's trajectory that was like, you know, while my grandfather made that uh, trip and chose to work within the system, you know, Harold makes the same trip uh, for the same reasons and chooses to work outside of the system. Right. Now, did you uh, grow up around? Did you know guys like that in the neighborhood in Queens or in Philly? Did you see gangsters oh, yeah. around? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if uh, I don't know if they would have called themselves gangsters. Maybe they would have. But yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, I saw guys coming up who um, who made different decisions with their with their lives. I knew that uh, I had the example of my grandfather. I had the example of my father. Uh, and I also knew like I wasn't some tough guy, you know, so I knew that uh, that wasn't my road, but absolutely. I knew there were guys around the way that um, 
yeah, took a very different path than I did. Did you did you uh, re- did you have a rehearsal period before you went into production for this? Not much. I mean, I, I had a, I have my own coach, you know, so I worked with my coach to build Harold the backstory. And uh, and um, no, I think my experience, especially as someone who wasn't who wouldn't have called themselves um, when I was shooting that movie, I couldn't have called myself a fan of this myself a fan of Sopranos. I am now. I very much am now. But back then I was, you know, I think my experience was probably uh, similar to you guys, not not to flatter myself in the in the work that I was doing. But I just mean, you know, you guys had nothing to compare it to and neither did I. You guys were getting great scripts from David every week, week in and week out. And you were if you were competing with anything, it was your work last season. You know, I'm gonna try to go a little deeper than I did last season. But I I I was just, I just had that great script from David. I had some cracking scene partners. I had Alan in my ear, making sure that I was um, within the confines of his vision. And that was, that was enough. Did, did David talk to you much on the set? Yeah, David was real hands-on. Uh, really? When Certainly when he felt like I was uh, out of bounds, you know, when he felt like it needed to be um, adhere closer to what he, uh, was thinking, you know, he definitely spoke to me. And there were times when uh, that wasn't always like, that wasn't always without tension. I don't mean in our relationship, but you know, like we didn't always, you know, see Harold quite the same way. But what I'll say is uh, uh, what I've also learned is like, um, you know, you use it all. And it's like, even even that, even the, the tension of that, or like the, the discomfort of that, you can like you can use in your work on camera. That's actor stuff. But you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like it doesn't it doesn't have to take you out. You're just like, you know, you you use it. And you shot this movie before COVID, right? Um, pretty yep. most of it. Yeah. Was last summer when protests erupted in the wake of the you know uh, what happened in in Minnesota. Did it give you any kind of different perspective on it after having, you know, investigated that history and, and, and seeing, you know, history repeat itself in a lot of ways in, in 2020? It wasn't really until I saw it, you know, like so, you know, like so many of us, man, I was in my I was in my body. I was in my present. Man, I wasn't thinking about these movies that I shot. I was, yeah. you, know, you know, the past year, bro, I've been like trying to keep my head above water, trying to make sure that my kid didn't lose her mind. My wife didn't lose her mind. Like, you know, trying to make sure I lose my mind. You know, it's just been a real dealing with like those real immediate trying to keep us all safe. You know what I mean? So uh, it wasn't really until I had the pleasure to sit in a theater. They had us at Warner Brothers and they, and they showed us uh, the film, you know, and I got to sit back and watch. I think Alan directed his ass off. Um, yeah. I got to sit back, right? I got to sit back and watch it. And I was like, wow, man. Um, yeah, it's prescient. And it, yes. is, uh, and it is powerful and, and beautiful. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, both you and Alessandro managed to do something because, you know, you have these characters who are making questionable choices with their lives and in this moral kind of ambiguity and gray zone and, you know, sometimes stepping over, you know, over that line. But yet you kind of understand them and there's a certain humanity that you bring to these guys that was really moving. Um, in the spite of all this, you know, criminal activity or whatever, you know, whatever it is they're doing. And and I thought it was it was pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't think that, uh, I, I think that David writes human beings, you know, he's not writing out and out villains for anybody. Having since watched the series, uh, Man, you guys walked that line so well. All of you guys, Jim, of course, led by Jim, but that spirit was in all of your work. You know, um, um, the stuff with you. You know, I almost called. I was like, I was almost called you, Christopher. And we've worked together. Michael and I worked, together, you know, and other things. But yeah, now, uh, you know, watching Christopher's uh, relapsing and and his and his um, 
desire for more respect and more, you know, wanting to take up more space and, you know, um, the conflicting feelings that that Tony felt for him. You know what I mean? Wanting so wanting him to do so well and him just being such a fuck up. Um, and then, oh, man, Steve, you, you had one of the one of the most surprising arcs on the whole series for me. Because, you know, I thought that when when they got around to you, finally, when David and the writers got around to you, you know, it, it showed how deep the bench was, you know, not that you were riding the bench, but, you know, you were, you were a guy in the margins. You know what I mean? You were a guy that was just, around, you know, the butt of the joke for so long, you know, when they when they got to the stuff with you and your family and your wife like that that's that arc with your wife was it just knocked me out so anyway i think that that's like i think it speaks to this to david's style you know he writes he writes complicated flawed interesting people and so mm -hmm. you deal with the given circumstances you're going to be great and like what david says he, he you know people never tell the truth yeah. he said most people don't tell the truth and that's why they don't say what they know. mean What's I just did though. I just meant what I said though. Oh no, I didn't mean, I mean that's not what I meant. No, I know. I'm it's talking so, amazing. I it's so fun from you so much. Believe it's fun me. watching it, watching it with that, with that in mind. When David says like, he's like, yeah, the, the key to writing it was just like everybody means the opposite. Of what exactly. exactly. <laughs> Nobody says what they mean. Listen, I don't think you're going to have to go on tape uh, much anymore for anybody after this movie. I couldn't thank you enough, me and Michael both. We loved your performance. Uh, I love Jen Hamilton. I have to bring that up. Uh, okay. So thank you very much, and, and good luck, my friend. Thanks, Leslie. Thank Be well. All you. the best. See you. Appreciate it. The great Leslie Odom Jr., ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Wow. Really a uh, thrilling performance he delivers in this movie. Have 100%. you seen Hamilton? No, I have not. You have to see Hamilton. Yeah. I mean, I saw it with the original cast, but yeah. brilliant stuff, and, and he is brilliant. I liked him in Smash. Now, you never watched Smash, but uh, there was a show on NBC that I liked. Uh, well, see, he was great as uh, Sam Cooke in One Night in Miami. I mean, tremendous. Great he's, stuff. He, great stuff. He's I one think. of our best, that's for sure. I'll tell you, Dick, it's paradise over there. On the one hand, you can't believe the beauty. On the other hand, they, they don't even have toilets. I told you, Subpoena, that you're gonna live the life of a proud American lady, and I'm gonna have my second set of children with you. And they'll be deluged with a life that they could never even imagine over there. Like you were, Dick, as a kid. These will be your brothers and sisters. <laughs> so, Giuseppina is your stepmother, Dickie. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great. Uh, this is a great episode. Nobody has what we have. We have the creator, the writer. If you don't know who he is, you probably shouldn't be watching this podcast. Um, we can. You know, we can say a lot uh, about him, but today he is the writer, producer, and creator of the film, Many States of Newark. Please welcome David Chase. Hey, David. Hey. Good to see you, How are you? How are you? I'm good. How's everything going? You running going crazy well, here? Huh? Everything's good. Uh, finally, uh, the, the movie comes out. and uh, Finally. <clears throat> I loved it. I believe Michael loved it. And uh, we get to see some new characters, some old characters, and really enjoyed it. That's all Good. I said. Good. Really enjoyed it. You know? Um, has it been? It's been in in the works for a while now. I mean, COVID kind of put a, put a delay on everybody's yeah, schedules. I, I think I've been doing it for four years, including four years. the writing. And then, uh, yeah, COVID put a real delay on it. But it was a good thing because it, we came back to it fresh after that and saw some things that we could use and we did it. What was the um, the initial idea for this movie? Like, where did it come from? How long have you, had you had it really in your head? Not a long time. I, I mean, <clears throat> I was talking to um, 
Tom Fontana one time, and he said it would be great to do a movie about Johnny and Junior back in the 30s. And that, that sounded good to me. But I never did it. And um, when, I, when I first got out of film school, I had an idea to do a movie about, this is 1970 or something like that, 71, about um, some guys in Jersey, uh, white guys in Jersey, who joined the uh, National Guard to get out of going to Vietnam, and they get sent in a tank down to the Newark riots. But I, I never did that either. Um, so I don't, but I don't know that that can be called the forerunner of this, really. You know, in the film, I mean, you really capture, I mean, it's a period piece, and you really capture it. I mean, you feel like you're right there. And Newark, who to this day hasn't really recovered, it's trying, and it's been trying, but I think that made a turn there, and it never quite made it back, you know, and from the costumes to the, uh, it's a lot of action. I mean, it's really well done. It's very exciting, you know. Great. Uh, yeah, Al, Alan, the cast did a wonderful job, and Alan Taylor did a great job. And and did you ever think about directing it? I was supposed to direct it at first. That was what the whole deal was. I would write it and direct it. But I, um, there was health problems in my family, mm -hmm. and so I couldn't do it. Was there any uh, ideas for you to do a storyline about Dickie Moltisante in the series? Were you ever considering that? No, no, never did. I don't believe how did that, I that now. How did that, you know, how, how did that idea get into your head to like make, because Dickie obviously is the, you know, the focus of the, his, his story is the focus of the movie. So how, how did that, how did you land on that? Well, when I decided to do it, um, I called on my friend, uh, Lawrence Connor, who, a friend of mine from way back, who had written a couple of episodes. We decided that we needed a central character who was as dynamic and as dangerous um, as Tony, but different. And I don't know, we were sitting there talking and we were, I, I guess I remembered Dicky Moltisanti. And I thought, yeah, we used to talk about how badass he was. And we decided that would be the guy to, to make the movie about. He's he's different in, in that, to me, he's a kind of a product of his time in the way that Tony is as well. Like, you know, and by time, I also mean like the Italian-American experience. Dickie's kind of closer to old school, you know, his mannerisms, his kind of mentality, where Tony is much more rooted in, in the America after, you know, a little right. later. Very true. Yeah. Yeah, Dickie. I mean, Dickie comes uh, comes along in our movie. Comes along um, before the the explosion of psychotherapy in America and psychology, um, and also before drugs exploded in the suburbs. And Tony comes after all that. Right. Yeah, but uh, Dickie's very slick, very classy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is slick guy. You know. Yeah. He, He's the gangster from my father's era, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, and now, uh, how did you, uh, Alessandro uh, Nivola, who just steals the movie, I mean, in my opinion, I mean, the guy is just fantastic. Yeah, he's, am he's amazing. Right out, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, how did you decide on him? Did you always have him in mind, or did no. you cross him? No. I didn't, you know, as much as we talked about Dickie Moltisanti on the show, I never really had a clear picture of him in my mind. I didn't know whether he was a hulking brute or whatever. I don't know. But um, Alessan I had seen Alessandro. Well, to, to begin with, it's a good thing we're not doing The Sopranos anymore because there's no more Italian actors in New York. That's all about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if they're going to law school. Or, I don't know what it is. Um, medical school. There aren't. Um, and I had seen Alessandro in American Hustle. I'm sure you've seen that. Yeah. Um, and also in The Most Dangerous Year. It was a story about the oil business in Queens. No? Oh, yeah. Five yeah. Five uh, five I said, yeah, yeah. And I thought he was great in both. And when I saw him in American Hustle, which was the first thing, 
I thought, you got to remember that guy. You know, if you need, if you need an Italian gangster, you got to remember that guy. And I always did. I, I thought he was, uh, it's kind of like De Niro in Godfather 2. I think he's going to get nominated for an Oscar. I'll be honest with you. He's oh, really be great. That'd be great. I really think so. And it's, what's interesting is for me as a viewer and also as an actor who played his son uh, on the series, right? It filled in a lot of, backstory in terms of Christopher and Tony's relationship why you know it really it started to really make sense like uh, Tony's connection to Christopher and all those things and uh -huh. um in in a very specific authentic way the and the other thing that really grabbed me with this movie is that it's a story about Dickie Moltisanti but it's also the Tony Soprano origin story in a way mm, well, you know, though, that word origin not, story I really don't know what that means um well, there's specific events that happen in the movie that really inform what happens to Tony later on in his life. Yes, that's true. Um, one that I can think of particularly. Yeah. Um, Tony Soprano is not the main character in the movie, but there's specific things that happen where you're like, oh, wow, this is what, you know, where a lot of this in yeah. the series comes yeah. from, like, the, yeah. you know, where planted. And, I, and that was a pretty amazing thing to pull off. I thought you did that really well. Um, well, I think thank you. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad for that. It wasn't always there. We we had to work for it. David, do you think if if you think if Jim would have, uh, if Jim didn't pass away, that you would have did a Soprano movie, a flat out um, Soprano movie with all the characters, whether it be a prequel, a sequel, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Well, you think, I said to think a couple of journalists, I had this idea for doing. Um, I, I once had this, you know, brain, really a brain fart idea for doing um, like a police station in Hoboken with all the same guys, but in police uniform. <laughs> just, <laughs> and just as crooked <laughs> and just as dangerous. But only, uh, and the only one from the show would be Dan Grimaldi, would be the only soprano. The other guy, these guys would all be in the police department. And, and you know, I never did it. It was only a j half a joke. Um, but no, I would not have done <clears throat> another Sopranos movie. Oh, we also thought at one time, yeah, we, we did think it. I did think of Terry, we all, of doing a movie about the making of Cleaver, the production of Cleaver, those 21 days or whatever it was. <laughs> and, um, that would have been that, funny. That, that could have been funny. That could have been fun. And, you know, Jim would have been in that. And, but it would have been different than just a Sopranos episode. Um, and I think I, I think I asked Jim what he what did he think about maybe tackling something like that? And he says to me, um, well, I have to read the script. <laughs> I mean, it's like you haven't read enough of the scripts to say yes, on a, you know, tentatively. Well, you know, he, he did say. You know, like, of course, when the show ended, you know, for he was for two or three years, he was very grumpy. But then when it came around, he said uh, if they paid him enough, he was open to doing a uh, yeah, sure. Soprano movie. Yeah. You know? At first, it was absolutely no fucking way, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then it was, you know, maybe, you know. Yeah. And of course, we heard from Sirico, you're fucking dead. You're never going to be in the movie anyway. You know, that's, that's what he, he would constantly tell me. You're fucking dead. You're not going to be in it. Well, you know, at one point, he said there was a movie. Remember? He was, he was, he told me there was a movie and he was the star of it at one point. Yeah. Oh, he said? Yeah. He kind of, in yeah. his head, he created a whole thing. Oh, okay. He would have been in it, of course. Uh, he would have been a cop, but he never would have wore a hat. You know that. Well, yeah. what, we, what we were going to do was have you guys be in a squad car together. He was the old veteran, <laughs> and you were the young, <laughs> the young cop. You know? <laughs> um, I, he would have uh, never. He I'm really never, sad that never happened, though. I know. No, it could have been now. fun. Yeah. Uh, Damn. How did you, how'd you decide to go with Michael Gandolfini as a young Tony Soprano? There really wasn't any choice. I mean, we read a bunch of guys, and it was not going anywhere. And and I guess the whole Michael thing had been in the back of my mind. And I suggested it, and we were all kind of like, oh, boy. Um, 
people could think, well, that's a gimmick. Or, and we didn't even know how it was going to be. Um, but I, somewhere right, right at the beginning, I said, this is going to work. It has to work. This is the way it's got to be. And he, you know, he auditioned many times and um, nobody, he never disappointed. He did a good job. He did a, really he did a good, good job. job. And he, you know, he, he had never seen the show. Um, really? No. So his father wouldn't let him watch it. And then he, I don't know, never got into it. I think maybe because his father was dead, it was too painful. But he, um, he watched it, all of it, after he was hired. And he, what that did for him was give him those little, you know, the shoulder stuff that Jim used to do, like he, just the little ticks and mannerisms. Yeah. I saw a lot of it. He, he, he had a lot of his mannerisms for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. You know, and then what did he do? I think he got, uh, chip I, tooth. Ask him, I think he got teeth, right? He got a chip yeah. tooth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. chip tooth, yeah. Well, I never knew Tony had a chip tooth. I never saw it. Neither did I. I never noticed. Yeah. That. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, what was the hardest role to cast? Uh, hmm. Paulie. He's so much larger than life anyway. So that it's really easy to go over the, you know, fall over the edge. Um, yeah, he was the, he was the hardest. I mean, in my opinion. And David, I mean, I know on the show, 99% of the people had to read or whatever the percentage is. Did most people read here? Yes, let me think now. Some didn't. A couple did not, but everybody else did. And did you give them a, were they allowed to ad lib at all? No. Improv a little? Nothing? <laughs> no. <laughs> Fuck no. no. Fuck no. I mean, that's the way we had done the show, so we stuck stuck to it. Yeah. I, listen, yeah. I'm all for it. I'm just, you know, I didn't, know of course, you know, I didn't know if it was, of course, a film. Maybe you said, ah, let them go a little bit, you know. Uh, I don't I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. You could ask Alan. I don't recall it. Yeah. It's very tricky. Usually actors try to be funny when they improv. I've oh. found that all the time. They always try to be funny with improvisation. Uh -huh. I don't know why. They never improvise dramatic stuff. It's always like little jokes and quirks and things yeah, like right. that. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, yeah, with really the Sopranos, it was, you absolutely did not have to ad lib improv. It was all on the page. Nothing could come out of my mouth or any actor's mouth is better than what was on the page. You know, honestly. Well, I'm glad. I'm really glad you feel that way. And you're not the only actor who said that about it. Um, we used to really go through all the potential bad stuff and weed it out. So we had thought it all through a lot every every episode. Yeah, you know what else that I noticed? You know, on other shows, right? You you know, on other shows. There's a lot of changes a lot of times. You know what I mean? You get a lot of notes. Blueprints. Rewrites and rewrites. After, yeah, you, after the actor oh, gets the script, yeah. And, you know, when we did the read-through, once in a blue moon there was a change, but not very often. I know. I know. We expected there always would be changes. But not very wasn't. often. No. No, I mean, once it got out. Those read-throughs were my favorite part of the whole process. It was so much fun seeing that stuff come alive, but without all lights and all that, it was just, it was great. Yeah, and seeing everyone together because usually we weren't for the most part together, no, and it, no. it was always fun to hear it every week. I don't think shows even do that. They don't have the time or the budget or the money or whatever reason. They don't do readers. They don't do no. no, I don't think it would help most shows. I'll be honest with you. You know, most shows, it's like they're kind of doing the same thing every week. I mean, I, in my opinion. So it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. It no. doesn't really exist. You know, like in a sitcom, they'll do, you know, Monday you do the read through and then by Thursday it's completely fucking different. They laugh Ooh. at all the jokes on Monday and wow. by Thursday it's. They change them all. <laughs> they wow. change it, you know, but well, no, you know, uh, one hour. Not on prime time. I mean, I've been on the show for years. We've never done a read through ever. Wow. You know, you mean you think that's true for streaming shows? And no, streaming shows probably do some. They may, you know, they may, you know, uh, they do less episodes. But when you're doing twenty or twenty two, and you're doing them in seven or eight days, oh yeah, 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 oh god, time, you know, mm -hmm. you know. Although, that, no, you're right. 
We used to do them uh, on the Rockford Files, except all the producers sat around and did it. Oh yeah, the no, actors didn't do it. No, the actors weren't there. They were on the, they were working seven day, you know, seven day show. So we would just read them to make sure there was the lines worked. If you, if you could tell, it worked okay. Well, but, you know, part of the reason I, I, I know we needed to do, we did read through because it was part of the protocol and because it, it taught us things. But I also think we stuck to it so faithfully, I think, because everybody liked it. Yeah. Everybody came to the read throughs with yeah. the Italian, you know, sandwiches and stuff and, and got a laugh. Yeah. That's what and I thought. And we, we uh, you know, most of us or a bunch of us would go out afterwards. That was our thing, you know. We, we weren't would working. Eat, or eat, Johnny. If you weren't working, then we would say, "Where are we going?" We wind up drunk somewhere into the wow. night. Wow, cool. <laughs> you know, cool. Uh, Michael, or Jim, or whoever. It depends on who was working or whatever. But, you and, know, we would do it, and I would go to Jim, and I'd say, "So, this is in the beginning. You know, you have anything to say?" No, no. So he would just save it <laughs> for the stage. <laughs> He wouldn't. He wouldn't discuss it with me then. <laughs> so you know, fix this or fix that. He would get to the stage and then it would come up. You know? but, but also he was working a lot, so oh, yeah. he was working and then came up to do this in the middle of you know they took a break. So he was like in one episode. He probably wasn't even thinking so far ahead. You know, yeah. to the next episode. Yeah, you yeah. Know? He, he was great. He was great. I mean, he was the only star of a show who never came around with his ideas or his girlfriend to be in the show or, you know, never, never. He never, he never pitched an idea. Uh, I remember him telling me a friend of his, a good friend auditioned for one line and he didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I think I remember that. Yeah. One line. Right. He said they couldn't give him one fucking line. <laughs> uh, you know, How many days did you shoot the movie in? 50-something, I believe. I don't recall now. I think it was 50-something. And then we had another eight days um, after COVID. You know who I really liked? Uh, Leslie Odom, Jr. I mean, great. he did a hell of a good job. Going. He's great. Hell of a good job. So good. You know. Uh, oh, he's, fan he's fantastic. Yeah, yeah he's, he's wonderful. It's so a, good. The relationship between Dickie and, and, uh, and his character really good. It's... It's a really solid part of the movie and uh, dynamic between yeah. them. Yeah. A lot going on there. Hey, David, do you think in today's landscape, you've probably been asked this before, could the Sopranos have been made now? No. No, no. way. No, not at all. I don't, well, to begin with, I don't think the people in the offices would get it. Where did I hear just the other day? One of the streaming, maybe Amazon, doesn't want to hear any pitches in which a woman uses sex to get what she wants. Um, well, the whole thing about The Sopranos was everybody was always, well, I don't know what the word is. Trying to get what they wanted. Trying, trying, what they want. trying to get what they want. Right. right. That's what it's all based That's on. kind of life, actually. <laughs> well, I know. You're right. It is kind of life. Basically. <laughs> Basically you know what, what Michael do. made me do just to do this podcast for him, David? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it would never be allowed out there, believe me. <laughs> Was there some musical choices that you had been waiting for, like songs that you kind of had in your back pocket you, that no. you were really happy to get to use? Not no. Necessarily. No. No, I didn't. Have, I didn't. I'm running. On, I'm kind of running out of those songs. And uh, if I get to do another movie, I, I think I'll try to go do something different. Well, the Stones. Uh, the, what's that? That's the one from Sticky Fingers, right? Um, yeah. Sway. Sway. Yeah. That's a great one. That's it's one of good, my favorite Stones. It's a good one. And, you know, it talks about time and all that. Yeah. And Astral Weeks, right? That was uh, a beauty. Oh, it's a great song. That's it's, a tremendous song. It's a great it? song. And I felt that, well, I'm not going to, it's going to, I'll give something away. Now, he was a, Van Morrison was a big soprano fan. He, yeah, he was. He's a big he soprano was. fan. Have you ever met him? Have you met him, David? 
I, I was in a lobby in a hotel, not in a lobby, in an elevator at the Carlisle, but Denise and I, and we're standing against the back wall and he comes in and he's like, you know, sh shorter than I am. So he comes in and he turns around and we're, so we're all facing that direction. So I didn't know whether to say anything or what. And so I said, Mr. Morrison, he goes, <laughs> he freaks out. <laughs> um, and it was really nice. Yeah, he's a big fan, right? Yeah. Goji was, yeah. I know I mean, Vic Pastore is friends with him. Oh, is he really? Yeah, he's friendly with him, and he says he's uh, a, a big, big fan, yeah. Well, we used a lot of his music in the in the series, wow. several of his, um, I mean. I know. We, the glad, uh, glad Tidings from New York. Mr. Glad Tidings Gott. worked out really well. Yeah. 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 He's, um, he's fantastic, you know? Yeah, a, a true, true genius. His music will be around long when he's long gone. Yeah, the beautiful sequence in the movie, though, uh, Astral Weeks. It's real because it's one of my favorite songs. And when it started playing, it just really hit me because it's really comes at a really emotional point in the movie. And it, uh -huh. there's something it always that song always like kind of hits well, me it in was, the gut. It was almost um, into the mystic. And then I just started thinking, that's just been used too much. And uh, Astral Weeks was just cooler and better for what we were using it for. Uh, the Italian actress that played uh, Dickie's Gormata, Yeah. how many girls did you have to read to find her? Not many. And she's from Italy, and you got... From Rome, yeah. yeah. We didn't have to read that movie. I think five or six. I, I mean, our casting director, uh, D Doug, um, talked to casting directors in, and agents in Rome, and she came up, and she was great. And she is the only one that we invited here to audition. I mean, the others auditioned on tape. She was good enough so that we brought her over, and she uh -huh. just knocked it out. She was great. Absolutely great. That's a, a great find. I'll tell you that. She's, a, she's an amazing. I'm thinking about it now that you're talking about it. Just the little things that were so fantastic in a language that isn't her own. But every little nuance was there. She was very good. Very, very good. That, uh, that scene with the, um, was it the Black Panthers? It was, uh, it was like kind of like a poetry slam moment. Oh, the, uh, the last poets, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that was, what, what was that uh, based on exactly? There there was a group. Um, I don't know where they were from. Were they from Newark? It might have been. There was a group of, um, called the Black Poets in 19, I don't know, maybe, I don't know when they started, but I became aware of them in 68, um, I suppose. And they are cons they are called the fathers of rap. The, uh, the last poets, you mean? Yeah. The last poet. What did I say? Yeah. Um, I did a reading with Umar bin Hassan once. He was one of the uh, the the uh, he's one of the members now. The last poet, really the more recent one. He's a really good, uh, a really cool dude. So that what that was that basically what I'm asking was that based on a um, specific event like uh, that. You know what was going on? How did on? that come up? That, that, well, that, the scene. That, yeah. Well, we, uh, how did it come up? We needed to get the, that point of view across to so the people in that neighborhood, right? In a, in a deep and serious way, and we wanted to have a poetry reading or something by. Um, by a, a former um, activist and dramatist and poet from Newark. A and, Baraka, right? Amira Baraka? Yeah. No, well, yes, Amira Baraka, yeah. His and, son, I think, is the mayor now of yeah. Newark. Right so now. that created a problem. So they just didn't want to give permission. Ah. And so okay. we thought, and then I started thinking, well, poetry up there and some guy talking. And I thought about the last poets. And I thought, well, it'll be music. It'll be much cooler. So that's what we did. It was really effective. And, and it just felt really authentic and really right. Good. Those guys are from Jamaica. 
but uh, it, they 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 were great. They were really good. Yeah, uh, I love that sequence a lot. I thought it was really really cool and a little. Alan and just did, really, did, it, did it really well. Shot it beautifully. Yeah. You know? uh, now, David uh, Ray Liotta does a great job in the movie. Now, I believe, and if I'm not mistaken, wasn't he offered the role of Ralphie? Uh, on the he Super was. Show? He was. Yeah. I went down from New York on a train to uh, Washington, then down to Richmond, and he was working, and we discussed it, and he said he would think about it, but then he turned it down. And then when the movie came around, obviously you called again, and he took this. I think the way it all worked out is the perfect thing. Um, I think Joey did a great job. Yeah. Um, and Ray here is like, I think masterful. Yeah, it does a great job. Great, great job. So obviously that was a guy that you put in the back of your head, you wanted to work with it and came around. Oh, that's true. You're right. You were asking me before. I mean, ever since I, I saw him in uh, Something Wild, did you ever see that movie? Jonathan Demme movie, yeah. yeah. It was really good. Wow, he was amazing. And it, the whole movie changed like in the last 10 minutes or so. It got yeah. very dark and violent. Really dark. Oh. He, it was yeah. scary. That was a classic uh, kind of like Star is Born moment, that movie. Yeah. For him, it really was. Um, is there any talk, I mean, I don't know if you can answer, is there any talk about making these characters live on in a series? Um, no. Um, I mean, I, I, oh, I've, I've read a lot of things online where people say it should be a series. But um, as far as I'm concerned, that's... <clears throat> probably not going to happen but you know i don't own the property i mean warner brothers can do what they want what about uh, another movie i think maybe that's possible i've said it before and i'll say it again uh, i would have a good time i think working with terry again on a movie terry winter yeah, yeah. now it, you know and he's expressed interest who knows if that'll ever happen but if it doesn't I, you know that this would be the last Sopranos movie. So you you don't you don't own it. So they could do if they chose to do a series without you. Yeah, sure. Oh, that would be a mistake. <laughs> I'll be honest. That would be a fucking mistake. It, it, it won't happen because they don't often make mistakes. Yeah. Uh, now the movie, the way it's been marketed, I I, I saw it in an interview. You. You didn't like it because it didn't focus on who you felt it. You know, Dicky Moltisanti is the star and it's his story. And they kind of, I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, in, in some of the trailers, you see young Tony Soprano more. Well, they emphasized, they emphasized it and they really felt that it, they felt that it would be a, to, uh, a Sopranos, a Tony Soprano origin story. And if it wasn't, we could make, you know, it's close enough. And that's not what Larry and I wrote about. That's not what's not what the script was. And that's not what Alessandro did. And I, I just, you know, and I, I, you know, I explained it to them. I, I wasn't happy with that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if it gets asses in the seat, they're going to see the movie anyway. So, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 maybe that's, it's kind of a moot point. I don't, you know, it's if, it's just going to get them in the art and get them to see it. That's always a good thing. Well, a lot of people. Are gonna, I mean, of course that's true, but a lot of people are going to see the movie, David. They're it's dying a for it. I mean, you know? kidding me? People are dying for this movie. They're I mean, it's Soprano mania again. I know. Isn't it amazing? It's amazing. You know, it, and then it was already happening all the way through COVID. And oh, yeah. I knew about it before COVID. I'd meet guys your age and they'd say, oh, my son or my daughter, you know, she's second year of college. It's all she wants. All they watch is your show. I mean, we see. Uh, no, it's oh, wow, that's incredible. Two I posted. Two. I posted the trailer when the trailer, the day the trailer dropped. I put it on my Instagram. I had in like two, three days, five hundred thousand views of it. <laughs> I only have a hundred at that point 130,000 followers so i mean it just went insane people were just like going nuts millions and, so and millions of people were writing what? Yeah. what millions and millions of people i mean maybe 10 million people have watched the trailer 
It's, I, I mean, I kept hearing these numbers like Michael is citing right now. I kept hearing that. I mean, it's, it, it, was there a time when, I don't know, did Billy Wilder go on the air and say, I think my trailer is really good? <laughs> no, probably so, not. Uh, Hitchcock, did he talk about the trailer? No. No. Did anybody talk about the trailer? No. No, but they, those things are just so... Because, you know, especially in the age of social media, every, uh, you know, every tidbit of if somebody's into something, every tidbit connected to it becomes consumed and becomes mm. passed over and picked yeah. over. It's very different now. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, you can communicate to your audience in a lot more direct manner than ever before, which is not a bad That's really thing. really true. That really is true. Yeah. You know, listen, uh, we have 200,000 plus people watching and listening to this right now. All over the world, right? Or All yeah. over the world. Yeah. From Australia, uh, Iran, uh, where? Singapore. We get messages from everywhere, David. Well, do they translate it? You know? No, they're, they, they're dying for it. People have been writing, can you do Russia. translations? No. <laughs> you know, um, and... and uh, I'd love to see you guys speaking, uh, speaking towards that. <laughs> I mean, Urdu. people are all over the world. Yeah, I mean, Urdu, yeah. And they're into it because of the show. They, they, you know, they watch the show and watch the podcast, or they watch the podcast and go watch the show. And then they see all the guests, from the smallest guests to the, big, the biggest guests, you know, from Edie Falco to somebody that did three episodes. They absolutely love it. We had Robert Patrick. I mean, he did 250,000 people. Plus, he did three really? episodes. I mean, has, has Grimaldi been on? Oh, yeah. 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 Did you yeah. see, uh, you know, we had Ricky Gervais as a kind of super fan, I celebrity. I see that. Fan. No. I'm Great not. interview. He had a lot of, you know, he really, uh, The Sopranos was a very big influence on him, and he was very articulate about it. And I very remember funny. when that happened, yeah. He it's was a really a, good I got to see that. Yeah, and he talks a lot about comedy and um, his work, but understands the show and and it, you know he came to the set one day right he was there the day the scene when finn is in the back of the pork store like that day great scene when he when tells finn, about Vito. great when scene. Finn tells the guys he saw Vito. he was there on the set that day um but it's a really good interview because he's you know he's so smart and and he has a lot of interesting things to say about the show so i, you, I think you'll get a kick out oh of it. definitely will really yeah. and then we did a thing david with super fans just regular people that watch it we got some That's over great 10, idea. thousand submissions from all 10, thousand submissions they had to write an essay <laughs> really yeah of why they should be on the podcast and they we had an oh, Oxford well, professor. great stuff there Oxford, we had eight people stuff. we had a professor from oxford university we had a guy who works at the Cavern Club in Liverpool. We had um, a, fi a, a woman who's a firefighter and a martial artist here in New York. Whoa. School that's, teacher in Kansas. No, that's, uh, that's a really great cool. idea. Yeah. Just amazing. Well, David, listen, best of luck with the movie, man. Thank really. you. People, you'll be out there. They're going to love it. So make sure you go see Many Saints in Newark. Thanks for giving us your time as always. Thanks for having me hopefully on. Hopefully we're going to see you for like the finale. You. We all like talking to each other. It's great. Yeah. We're going to really see great. you for the finale, right? One more time. What? We're gonna, you're going to come back on for the finale, hopefully. Oh, yeah, sure. All yeah, right. One I more time. It. I love it. Thank you so much, my friend. Okay. Take care. Good luck. Okay. The great David Chase. That was a great interview. Fantastic. Great. Don't get better than that. Everything you want to know, you just heard, my friends. What do you want, Richard? I'll be honest with you. I want the money. I want to do a good deed. I want to do a lot more. The best things in life are free. I try to set an example for my nephew. Give them to the birds and bees. I want the money. Anthony got kicked out of school. I went through all that trouble. And for what? I'm always being accused. You're going to be good. That's I want to do whatever I can to help the family. That's what I want. Money don't get everything, it's true. What it don't get, I can't use. I want money. wonder what they talk about in there. I didn't catch the name. Pussy. <laughs> Put him on the table. 
think I just got this jacket. You know, I, I try so hard. Gotta do something about Dickie Malasani. What a blow. I know you can get anything. Look at Dickie Malasani. He steps up, takes care of his family, takes care of all the business. If anybody tells anybody about this, what are you doing on your merit badges? I want to do all kinds of good things. It's the one thing. Pain comes from always wanting things. But who do I know? I'm a murderer. The best things in life are free. All right, Steve, there you have it. The cast and the creator, The Many Saints in Newark. Uh, for our fans, if you haven't seen it yet, the time is now. It is out. It is available in your theaters, uh, theaters near you, and HBO Max. Yeah, it's it's a great movie. And, and these interviews were just incredible. No one, uh, nowhere else can you see all of these guys in one place. Uh, we love talking to them. And David Chase, second time he's on the podcast. He'll be joining us again later on. So... Get out there, HBO Max and in theaters. Enjoy the film. Uh, thanks for listening. Remember, new episodes are released every Monday. Please subscribe. Talk to Sopranos Podcast, YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram and like us on Facebook. Uh, our executive producer is Jeff Sussman, producer is Andy Verderome. Our theme music was composed and performed by Elijah Amiton. Elijah and I play in a band called Zopa. You can hear more of Elijah's music and the band's music uh, by clicking the links at TalkingSopranos.com. Production crew includes Ty Verderam and Sierra Sharippa. Talking Sopranos is a Pod Jams production. All right. Later. All right. <laughs>